Um, this is the December 15, 2020 meeting of the Landmark Preservation Commission, and I will bring this meeting to order. We will start with the introduction of the uh, commissioners. I'll start with myself. Um, I'm Julie Johnson. I am a Historic Preservation Project Manager, and I was nominated from the community at large. Oh, Jeanette is not here. Um, Brad? Uh, my name is Brad Gassman. I'm an architect, and I was nominated by History Colorado. Aaron? Sorry, having mute problems. Hi, I'm Erin Hummel. I'm a landscape architect nominated by the American Society of Landscape Architects. Awesome. Graham. I think he's not here yet. He's the one that I was, oh. we have a quorum, but but we're still waiting for Graham to be the he's fifth. The, yeah, no, no worries. Gary. Hi, this is, uh, I'm Gary Petrie. I'm an architect and I uh, was nominated by the Denver Planning Board. Thank you. Anne? Anne Lautenberg, I'm an architect nominated by the American Institute of Architects. All righty, thank you. Um, we do not have any meeting notes uh, this time, so we don't have anything to, uh, to approve. Um, at the beginning of every meeting, we have a public comment period where members of the public have up to two minutes each for comments about historic preservation in general. Um, these do not include comments associated with any of the projects that are later under review. Um, if you are joining by phone, please email landmark at denvergov.org with your name and phone number and on which project you'd like to speak. If you're joining computer, please click and click the hand raise function. Jen, do you see anyone? Uh, we have a hand raise. Um, so Rebecca has a bunch of people have just started putting their hands up, but they're applicants for projects. So um, I'm okay. going to, um, if, if you're an applicant for a project, that's great. Um, we'll have you speak at another time. If you'd like to provide a public comment, not about a project uh, specifically, then we can um, have you uh, give, you have up to two minutes right now. So um, let me uh, allow, so Ty, you still have your hand up. I'm going to allow you to talk if you'd like to to talk, you'll need to unmute yourself on your computer. And I see you're unmuted. Okay, um, could you please give your name Perfect. for our record? Ty, could you please give your name and address for our record, please, before you give your comment? Now I've been muted. Nope, we can hear you. Yeah, we can hear you. <laughs> Ty, did you have a comment, a general comment about historic preservation for us? I don't know if anyone can hear me, but yes. once I pushed unmute, I can't hear any of you. I was prior to hitting unmute. That's super strange because we can hear you when you speak. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you recommend? We, so Ty, um, is your comment a general historic preservation? Uh, what up? How about this? I'm going to promote Ty to be a panelist. And if he has okay, a great. comment, then we'll move him back. It should resolve some of those issues. Terrific. Thank you. OK, so Ty, you are now a panelist, which means that you can unmute yourself when you are ready. You um, have up to two minutes. We're still not hearing you. Yeah. Who are you? Great. Jennifer? Oh, oh yep. okay. Yep. You can hear me. I, I can hear you. Okay, thank you. 
Okay. Sure. Ty, did you have a, a comment, a general comment about historic preservation for us today? No, just about our specific project. Okay, then we will we will leave that for when we review your project. But okay. but the good news is we've got we've got your you figured out so you can join the meeting. Okay. Uh, seeing that there are no uh, other public comments, um, we will move on to the consent agenda. Um, so these are routine design items recommended for the commission approval without discussion. Applicants with items passed on the consent agenda should coordinate separately with the landmark preservation staff to receive a um, certificate of appropriateness. There is no public comment for consent agenda items. Um, the consent ag agenda items are 2020-COA-420-17900 Pueblo Trading Post, 2020-ZLAM-088295 Bannock, um, are there any um, commission members that have a conflict of interest or anything that they'd like to? All right. Um, are there any um, questions or comments that um, any of the commissioners would like to make? Anybody have questions that they would like to pull an item for discussion? All righty. Well, uh, seeing as there is none, um, let's move on with uh, the voting. I will. Um, Let's see, the commission, uh, can I get a um, motion to approve the consent agenda as presented by staff? I can make the motion. Madam is Chair, okay? oh, is that okay? Mm -hmm. Madam Chair, I, I move to approve uh, items 2020-COA-420-17900 Trading Post Road, the Pueblo Trading Post, and item 2020 ZLAM-088-295 Bannock Street, Baker. Thank you, Ann. Um, may I have a second on the motion? I'll second that. Thank you, Gary. Um, because we're, we're virtual, we'll need to do a, a roll call. So um, roll call vote. So Brad. And, and oh, Graham yeah. has joined the meeting. Yeah, hi, Graham. Sorry for being late. <laughs> Uh, you're the contractor. <laughs> uh, Brad? Aye. Aaron? Aye. Graham? Aye. Gary? Gary? You're muted. Okay. Aye. <laughs> Thank you. Anne? Aye. And um, for the record, Julie, I, I will vote aye as well. Um, the motion passes. And uh, anyone who is online listening for the consent agenda, if one of those is one of your projects, then um, you do not, your, your project has been approved. So congratulations. Just get in touch with the staff person that you've been working with. Uh, we do have a public hearing item. And I believe that's Jenny Bodenberg that's going to uh, talk to us about um, of 6400 Montview Boulevard. Could you go over the process real quickly? I certainly can. Thank uh, you. Uh, let's see. So the, let's see. The chair will announce a public hearing by the dress. Commission members announce ex parte contracts or conflicts of, errands, of interest. Staff will introduce the application and recommendation. Uh, commissioners can question the staff. The applicant presentation has uh, is limited to 10 minutes. Commissioners may question the applicant. Uh, the public comment period is three minutes per person. If you would like to speak regarding a specific project and you are not part of that applicant team, please click the hand raise function. For those on the call, email landmark at denvergov.org prior to the public comment period. Then we can ask for staff clarifications if necessary. Um, the commission will deliberate and the commission will make a motion and vote. And I don't know if I gave you in, put in the instructions that you'll need to open the public hearing as um, the chair. Okay, um, I will now open the public hearing. Great, thank you, Julie. Oh, thank you, Jen. 
Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, today I'm presenting on the proposed historic designation of the residential property located at 6400 Montview Boulevard in the South Park Hill neighborhood. The ability to designate individual landmarks and historic districts in the city and county of Denver is set forth in the 1967 Landmark Preservation Ordinance. Since then, the city has designated nearly 350 individual landmarks and almost 60 historic districts that are scattered across the city, as you see indicated on the map. This is roughly 7,000 buildings across the city and county of Denver, or about 4% of the city or one in 25 structures that are designated landmarks. And sorry, I'm navigating between two screens here, which is a little new for me. So I'm gonna try to keep up on my speed here. Um, the designation process is community driven and applications can be submitted by a variety of persons. For this property, the owner submitted the designation application. The owner applicant is Rebecca Rogers. Uh, this is in the South Park Hill neighborhood as previously mentioned. This is council district number eight, Christopher Herndon. And the current zoning is USUE, which is a single unit district allowing urban houses with a minimum zone lot area of 7,000 square feet. In order for a property to be designated, it has to meet a set of criteria that you see on the screen here. It has to be more than 30 years old or of exceptional importance. It has to meet at least three out of 10 significance criteria, maintain its integrity, and be considered by the LPC for relation to a historic context or theme. And I'll run through each of these criteria with you today. The structure built in 1936 is more than 30 years old. It also meets three significance criteria that you see highlighted on the screen. It meets C to embody the distinctive visible characteristics of an architectural style or type be a significant example of the work of a recognized architect or master builder, and represent an established and familiar feature of the neighborhood, community, or contemporary city due to its prominent location or physical characteristics. And I'll go through each of these significance criteria in detail here with you. The single unit residence at 6400 Montview Boulevard embodies the distinctive visible characteristics of a side gabled subtype of the Spanish eclectic style. It possesses several identifying features, including an asymmetrical facade, stucco cladding with decorative brick, tile roof with multiple levels, elaborate chimney top, arches above principal windows, arched front entry with decorative ironwork and sconces, balcony with iron railing on the primary facade, and second story covered porch and round tower at the rear that you can see just above the trampoline from the photo there. The Spanish eclectic style often also includes elaborate landscaping features and this property is no exception with its flagstone walkway depicting moon phases leading to the front entry, which you can see in the second image from the left, and flagstone back patio with sun imagery. It is one of a few Spanish eclectic style houses in the South Park Hill neighborhood. Its construction occurred at the tail end of the popularity of Spanish eclectic style in the United States that spanned 1915 to 1940. The property is a significant residential example of the work of recognized architect J. Roger Music and master builder Harry M. Bittman, often designing in partnership with his older brother G. Meredith Music on civic and religious commissions. This venture represents the only known Spanish eclectic style residence designed by J. Roger Music in Denver. It is consistent with his residential designs in that it is a straightforward interpretation of the Spanish eclectic style and includes a prominent main entrance accented with a large decorative surround. It differs in its use of stucco as opposed to brick or stone, which is more commonly found on music's residential designs. A graduate of the Beaux-Arts Institute of Design in New York City, music's commercial, civic, and religious designs have gained more recognition to date than his residential designs, including the Berkeley Park Chapel that you guys recently designated as a Denver landmark and the Colorado State Capitol Annex. Music was a Denver-based architect from the late 1920s to late 1960s. For this property, Music partnered with master builder and property owner Harry M. Bittman. Bittman's career in Denver spanned from 1928 to 1967 and included both residential real estate development and construction. He served as president of the Home Realty Company, was a founding member of Quality Home Builders, Inc., and formed the Bittman Construction Company. His partnership with G. Roger Music on the design of this property influenced Bittman to build a similar Spanish eclectic style residence 
at 4833 East 6th Avenue in 1937, just a year later, that is not credited to J. Roger Music. This influence took place early in Bittman's long lasting career, making this a significant example of his work. And lastly, for the significance criteria, the property represents an established and familiar feature of the neighborhood due to its physical characteristics as the only true two-story Spanish eclectic style residence and its prominent location along Montview Boulevard. Montview Boulevard between Colorado Boulevard and Monaco Parkway consists of large residences and lots designed to be prominent with more modest residences tucked into the side streets. This stretch of road and green space that com comprises Montview Boulevard is part of Denver City Beautiful Movement Parkway's historic district, which you can see indicated on the map shaded in brown. The property at 6400 Montview Boulevard stands out among the other large residences along the parkway that are primarily Tudor revival and ranch styles constructed of brick. Its stucco clad walls and distinctive design elements stand in contrast to its surroundings, making it a familiar feature of the South Park Hill neighborhood. In respect to change over time, the property retains a high degree of integrity and has experienced minimal alteration. It retains integrity of location, setting, feeling, and association as it is in its original location, is still used as a private residence, and the surrounding residential context has been largely unaltered since original construction of the property. Integrity of design, materials, and workmanship have been impacted with the replacement of the original windows and garage door. However, key character defining features of the structure like the tile roof decorative metalwork and brickwork, stucco cladding, arch surrounds, decorative flex on walkway and back patio, and rear second story porch and tower are preserved. The property retains the identity for which it is significant. Lastly, the property meets several historic contexts and themes with a 1936 period of significance. Constructed during the Great Depression, 6400 Montview Boulevard represents residential development by the affluent that occurred at that time in Denver neighborhoods like Park Hill and Hilltop. It is also within the context of the racial segregation that was forced upon real estate development through redlining efforts that began with the creation of the Federal Housing Administration in 1934, as illustrated by this redlining map. Park Hill was an overwhelmingly white populated neighborhood at the time 6400 Montview Boulevard was developed. The purchase of this house in 1936 by original owner and wealthy advertising executive Clarence M. Hauer is consistent with the redlining framework. The property also relates to the theme of housing near Denver's parks and parkways. The park and parkway system as part of the City Beautiful movement was designed to be an integrated system of stately public buildings and appealing surrounding neighborhoods. Development of the property at 6400 Montview Boulevard occurred much later than those active years of the original design and implementation of this movement in the early 1900s. However, it still falls within this context through development of Montview Boulevard as a city beautiful parkway stemming from City Park and bookending at Monaco Street Parkway. In summary, the property meets all criteria for historic designation. It is 84 years old, it meets three designation criteria, C, D, and F. It maintains its integrity and relates to several historic contexts and themes. Five individuals submitted emails in support of the designation and none in opposition. Oops. All right, we had a little bit of a lag there. So therefore, staff recommends approval of designating 6400 Montview Boulevard as a structure for preservation. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, have any of the commissioners questions for staff? No? All righty, seeing none. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, we will uh, now hear from the applicant. The applicant has 10 minutes to present uh, the project and um, the commission will be able to ask questions of the applicant. And is the applicant there, Jennifer? Or Jen? Yes, uh, yeah, Emily is moving people over, right? Just move them both. Uh, Excellent. No, you just unmuted them, that's it. Let me promote them. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> All right, for the applicants, uh, welcome. And please, before speaking, please uh, state your name and your address. Sure, should I go first? I'm Rebecca Rogers. I'm yes. the applicant and resident of 6400 Montview Boulevard. Um, 
My journey to designate my home at 6400 Montview Boulevard uh, began several years ago. Back in 2014, I joined the Board of Historic Denver because I was passionate about preserving and celebrating the unique history of Denver. As I learned more about the history of the great, this great city, I felt more passionate about working to preserve its unique and limited historic structures and neighborhoods. As a result, in 2015, I hosted a community, community meeting at the Park Hill Library to educate people in the neighborhood about historic districts. I firmly believed Park Hill was the perfect place to create a historic district and hoped others would feel the same as well. Out of this meeting, a group of approximately 10 neighbors started meeting twice a month to work towards creating a historic district. I was really hoping that we'd all agree on an area that to tackle for the district that would include my house. And I was hoping we'd create a historic district along Montview, the Grand Boulevard in Denver's first streetcar suburb. Unfortunately, I was outvoted and we started our efforts in earnest to work on a district in the original subdivision of Park Hill. I pledged I would seek to have my home on Montview individually designated. And as the road to the neighborhood historic district has taken many turns and even many more years, I've decided to move forward with the work on my own designation. When I moved to Denver in 2003 from Milwaukee, I was looking for a neighborhood, one like many of the neighborhoods that existed in Milwaukee with large trees, parkways and historic homes. I was surprised to discover that not many of these neighborhoods existed in Denver. When I happened upon Park Hill, I fell in love. I would drive to the neighborhood just to take walks and to house watch up and down the street. Even back then the house prices were high, especially for a younger single woman. I eventually found a starter home right off of Colfax on Jasmine. I fixed up that home and started moving to a slightly larger fixer upper and that led me to houses on 23rd, on Forest, and on 17th Avenue Parkway and Cherry. And then finally to 6400 Montview Boulevard. We've now been in our Montview homes since 2013. We have completed many projects in that time, including stucco repair, masonry and roof restoration, windows, electrical upgrades, replacing missing bathroom floors, uh, renovating the bathroom and the kitchens, um, just to name a few projects. Everything we've done has been done in a way that we hope celebrates the home's historic character and architectural style. We want to designate our home to ensure that it's around for generations and to reflect Park Hill's diverse historical architecture along Mount View Boulevard. What I love most about our house is its connection to the past and its historic architectural character. I can feel the families that have loved and lived in this house before us, and I can only hope that the families that come after us and call our house their home will feel the same connection. Our house is an integral part of what makes Park Hill an amazing historical neighborhood. There are not very many of these neighborhoods in Denver. It is a rare gem, and if we don't protect these unique older homes, they will be gone forever. It doesn't matter if the homes are small or large, a single example of architectural style or an intact role of bungalows. We can't recreate this history. Um, they will be lost forever if we don't protect them. So I hope that my house can stand as an example of what can be done to protect Denver's past for our future generations. All right. Are there any other, um, anybody else with the application that would like to speak? Yes, um, my name is Shannon Stage and I am the preservation coordinator with Historic Denver. Thank you, Jennifer, for Jen for putting up the timer. I'll kind of keep track of that. My address is for our address at Historic Denver is 1420 Ogden Street, Denver, Colorado. We are thrilled to be here today to show our support at the Landmark Preservation Commission for the Bittman Hauer House designation. Rebecca Rogers mentioned this in her in her talking points, um, but she did reach out to Historic Denver a while back uh, to get her to get involved, and then also to help her land make, excuse me landmark her house and start that process. Um, as she mentioned too, she's been an active partner in being uh, one of our board of trustees for Historic Denver. Rebecca eventually hired Christy Miniello of Miniello Consulting to research and write the landmark application that came before you. Jenny did a great job of explaining all the reasons why the Bittman Hauer House is important to preserve and why it is significant to Denver's history. 
Jenny mentioned this, um, but I also wanted to reiterate that it sits at the intersection of two designated resources, the Montview Boulevard and Monaco Parkway, which is part of our National Register and our local designation Parks and Parkway system. We want to also commend uh, Rebecca and her family for their stewardship of the house and hope that their action will inspire others in the neighborhood, which is home to many terrific resources, but few designations. Historic Denver supports this landmark designation, and I am also happy to answer any questions that the commission has for um, Rebecca and also just the application in general. Thank you. All right, is there anyone else, a part of the application that would like to speak or is that is just the two of you? That should be it. Okay, excellent. Commissioners, have you any questions for the applicants? No, doesn't look like it. Alrighty, then uh, at this point, the members of the public are welcome to comment um, either at the standing mic in the web building. I don't know if anybody's there. Uh, doesn't look like it uh, right now. Um, but also, um, if you're joining by phone, email landmark at denvergov.org with your name and phone number or raise your, raise the, use a hand, raised hand function so that uh, staff can, can let you in. Jen, do we have any, anyone interested in, in comments? I'm not, I'm not seeing any hand raises and um, I'm guessing that it doesn't look like there's anyone at the web building. We don't have anyone on the phone today. So okay. if you, okay. you don't have to repeat that, those instructions, cause I'll let you know if someone joins by phone. Okay. Okay. Great. Yeah. It looks pretty empty over there. The web, web building. Okay. All righty. Um, if there aren't any public comments and we'll close the public hearing and commission will deliberate. So commission members, what do you think? Gary? Um, I, well, I support this recommendation. I, I have a question that will relate to the motion when we get to it. Uh, on the screen, the staff recommendation is listing a December 8th report, but the printed material mentions a November 8th report. So we just need to get that correct. Um, okay. Um, whichever, whichever one it is. But I do support this. I, I think uh, I commend the uh, owner of the property for stepping forth and showing an example to the rest of the uh, Park Hill community that there's much there uh, to much in the neighborhood that uh, reflects uh, a significant period of history and development and uh, architectural uh, uh, excellence. So uh, I'm going to support this recommendation. Great. Thank you, Gary. Um, anyone else? I'll agree. I, I think it has a great story and, and uh, I feel good about the criteria that it meets. So kudos to the owner. All right. Yeah, this, this is Brad. I agree with Graham and uh, Gary. I think it clearly meets the criteria and it was uh, it's a really exciting project to learn a little history about. Yeah, I agree. Um, anyone else wish to comment? Um, I'm not seeing anybody else that wants to comment. So can I, um, so we will need a motion. And how do we, so how do we fix that um, in the motion? So this is Jenny, that it should be the December 8th, 2020 staff report. I'm not sure what you're referencing in printed. Maybe it's the instructions you guys were given for the motion for the meeting today. Alrighty, thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Mm -hmm. So the motion would have to review the December 8th staff report. Okay. Madam Chair, I, this is Brad. I will uh, make the motion. Thank you. I move to recommend approval and forward to city council the landmark designation of 6400 Montview Boulevard, application number 2020L-003, based on the landmark ordinance designation criteria C, D, and F, citing as finding of facts for this recommendation, the application form, public testimony, and the December 8th, 2020 staff report. Brad, thank you. Do I hear a second? I'll second that. Thank you, Gary. Um, well, being virtual, we will take a roll call. Um, Brad? Aye. Aaron? Aye. Graham? Aye. Gary? Aye. Ann? Aye. And uh, Julie votes aye as well. Um, the motion passes. Um, congratulations to the applicants and good luck with city council.
Thanks, Jenny. So now we go into the design review um, portion of the meeting. Um, the, uh, I will announce the design review uh, items on the agenda. Uh, the commission members will announce any ex parte contacts or conflicts of interest. And the staff will introduce the application and recommendation and commissioners can question the staff. Um, each applicant presentation is limited to 10 minutes and commissioners may question the applicant. Public comment period um, is two minutes per person. And as before, if you would like to speak regarding a specific project and you are not part of that applicant team, please click the hand raise function for those on the call, email landmark at denvergov.org prior to the public comment period. Uh, staff can clarify if necessary. Um, the commission will deliberate and then the commission will um, motion and vote. Um, the first design review project is 2020-COA-422. That's 3043 Stout Street, and I believe we're hearing from Brittany. Um, so our first application today is for a new infill um, construction at 3043 Stout Street in the Curtis Park Historic District. Um, so the applicant and property owner is proposing to construct a new two-story single-family residence with attached, with, sorry, detached garage. Uh, the proposed infill development is a mansard roof form with a raised foundation, a full width porch, and uh, two chimneys on the south elevation, and a small single-story garage. Um, so the lot is part of the Denver Housing Authority's redevelopment of the Platte Valley homes, um, which you can see an aerial and some photographs of the existing site. Uh, the DHA has reconfigured the block, demolishing several of the um, previous buildings and dividing part of the block into new zone lots that will be sold off for single family residential development. Uh, the DHA retains buildings on the north and south and east sides of the block, which you can see here in this aerial, um, that are those U-shaped uh, developments. Um, the DHA has issued an RFP for the development of the site. Um, so again, just the um, general aerials of the site. Um, so here we can see where the proposed infill development will be sited um, relative to the uh, um, adjacent DHA properties and the properties across the street. Um, this is the second infill development that the commission has reviewed on the Stout um, Street side of the property, which will all be single families on 25 foot um, lots. Um, the applicant is uh, requesting an 18 foot setback. Um, a zoning does require a 20 foot setback on this site. Um, this uh, request for an 18 foot setback is a result of a seven foot private sewer easement. Uh, for the DHA buildings in the rear of the lot. On December 1st, 2020, the commission reviewed the first single family home redevelopment on the DHA site at 3053 Stout Street, which is um, two lots up. The project uh, proposed an 18 foot setback at that site as well. At the time of the December meeting, uh, Landmark staff were still working with zoning administration to determine if these projects would qualify for an administrative adjustment. On December 3rd, don't zoning administration confirmed to landmark staff that an 18 foot setback would qualify for an unusual circumstance per section 12.4.7.5.B.1.A point 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 of the zoning code um, based on the fact that the zone lots are technically shorter than the standard zone lot due to this imposition of the easement. Um, landmark staff feel that all development on the uh, side of the Stout Street should have a consistent setback and are also supportive of the 18 foot setback. Um, this will also match again 3053 Stout Street, which the commission reviewed at the December 1st meeting. A recommendation from the commission on unusual circumstances is not required and the applicant has been advised on how to proceed. Um, with that 18 foot setback uh, for that administrative adjustment there. Um, in terms of the structures placement on the lot, it will be located on a 25 foot lot, which is typical of, of the Curtis Park Historic District. Um, the proposed structure is 19 feet uh, wide by 62 feet, five inches, and um, will have a garage footprint of 19 feet by 21 feet. 
Uh, proposed structure is centered on the lot, creating a front, rear, and side yard. Uh, proposal will have a significant amount of depth on the lot. However, the bulk of the primary structure is located in the front 65 of the lot. Um, as I mentioned, the structure is 19 feet wide. This is typical of the Curtis Park Historic District. And then the attached garage is located on the rear of the lot, uh, 16 feet, 10 and three quarters of an inch from the primary structure. Um, zoning does require 15 foot separation between the primary structure and the secondary structure. Um, again, the infill will be set back 18 feet from the sidewalk um, edge, uh, which will require an administrative adjustment through the unusual circumstance um, hardship through zoning. Uh, this is similar to the setback that has been approved for 3053 Stout Street um, by the commission at the last meeting. Uh, the proposal will feature a full width porch, which you can see here in the site plan. Um, the porch is encroaching into the 18 foot setback by um, six feet at the uh, foundation and eight feet at the porch. This is similar to 3053 Stout Street. Um, which will have a similar uh, foundation encroachment. However, that proposal um, didn't have a porch roof as presently designed. So um, comparatively, we can only compare it with the, the foundation footprint, but this is typical of porches within the Curtis Park Historic District. Um, the building entrance is oriented to the street and will be located on the side of the structure, which is typical of Curtis Park. Um, so here we have the front and rear elevation. Um, a raised foundation is proposed. Uh, the overall height of the structure is 27 feet, um, which is typical of the Curtis Park Historic District. Um, uh, the adjacent DHA properties do not have the raised foundation. However, these were constructed in 1940. And um, staff do believe that having that raised foundation that is typical of uh, Curtis Park homes is important to reinforcing the character of the Curtis Park Historic District. Uh, floor to floor heights are typical. The ground floor will be taller than the second floor um, and the applicant has carefully studied the proportions of mansard roofs within the district to mimic the proportions of mansard roofs. And I do have a slide um, to show that uh, later in the presentation. Uh, windows and doors are typical of the mansard form um, with tall ground floor windows and second floor floor windows that are engaged into the roof um, with a boxy surround, um, dormer surround. Uh, buildings within the Curtis Park Historic District are very tall, typically um, up to 30 feet in height, common in the district. Again, this applicant is proposing 27 feet tall, um, so it is at within typical heights for the Curtis Park District. Uh, the facade has been designed to reflect typical mansard proportions. Um, again, I'll have a slide showing that later, um, but the ground floor is a 60% uh, percent ratio to the mansard form, which is a 40% ratio. Um, the applicant has included architectural banding um, that you can see in this image here. That is um, typical of some of the mansard forms within Curtis Park. Um, although we don't see this often in this historic district, um, the applicant does have uh, justification for that, um, that architectural banding that you see in this slide here. Um, here we have the side elevations. Again, you can see those chimneys that are proposed. Um, again, typical window forms and proportions uh, for this structure. Again, a simple single story garage. Uh, here is the north elevation of the proposal, um, very similar. Uh, you can see that that um, door is recessed a little bit um, from the primary wall facade, which is typical of the Curtis Park Historic District. And there will be a secondary entrance um, towards the rear on the structure. Uh, the garage is just a simple one story uh, garage structure. Um, there's not much to note here, although it is typical of uh, garage forms within the Curtis Park Historic District. Um, so here we can see a comparison of uh, the mansard roof forms within the Curtis Park Historic District. Um, and if you look at your um, application packet, 2601 Champa Street does have a similar architectural banding at the ground floor windows that the applicant is pulling inspiration from. Um, the roof form is compatible with the Curtis Park Historic District. It's a mansard roof form. 
Um, this is a uh, roof form that is pretty unique to the Curtis Park uh, Historic District and new um, construction within this district does not often take advantage of this form, but it is rising in popularity with two mansard roof forms recently approved by the commission in the last two years. Um, the window proportions are uh, typical of um, the Curtis Park Historic District, um, but I'm going to go back to the uh, front elevation really quickly as I do have a comment that I would like to note um, for the design details. Um, within Curtis Park, uh, typically um, windows that are grouped together have a mullion that separates them. Um, currently, the applicant is not proposing that mullion detail. Um, we do feel that it could be added in the phase two um, if the commission feels like it would be helpful. Um, however, we do also feel that not having that mullion does help distinguish this as new construction. Uh, ground floor uh, windows on the front facade will have sills and they are um, of a simple design. They are arched. Um, staff is recommending that the applicant do look at the um, proportions for where that um, sash is for those ground floor windows. As you can see, that bottom sash is much shorter than the topper sash, and we would recommend an arch window that has a more proportional upper and lower sash for the front facade, as that is more common to uh, the Curtis Park Historic District. Um, so at this time, uh, we are recommending approval of this structure. And we are also requesting that the commission um, recommend an administrative adjustment for height and bulk plane for section 12.4.53 of the Denver Zoning Code. Um, so here in this front elevation, you can see um, that portions of the roof are within the bulk plane. It is not taller than the um, required height for Curtis Park, but portions of the roof are within the bulk plane. And staff feel that this is um, typical of the Mansard development within the Curtis Park Historic District. So here you can see those comparisons to similar Mansard forms within the Curtis Park Historic District. And then that proportional relationship of the Mansard form to the ground floor. So we feel that um, violating the bulk plane here um, is, is appropriate because it does make the form more contextual to the surrounding historic context as the applicant has um, significantly studied that Mansard roof form. Um, so we are recommending approval because the proposed infill development will occur on a vacant lot and reinforce the 25 foot lot development pattern within the Curtis Park Historic District and overall massing is compatible with the surrounding historic context. Okay, Brittany, thank you. Um, commissioners, have you any questions for staff? Okay, seeing none, uh, seeing no questions from staff uh, or, or for staff, um, the applicant will have up to 10 minutes to make a presentation. Um, is Jen, is the applicant present? Yep, Emily, you're moving them over. Yep, there they go. All yep. right, um, the applicant, please state your name and your address before your presentation, thanks. Hi, uh, this is Mike McAtee. Address is 2790 Josephine Street, Denver 80205. <clears throat> um, first of all, I'd like to just say thanks to Brittany again and, uh, and the time that she spent on this as well as the time that uh, Curtis Park Arno has spent on it with us. To, uh, to briefly kind of give you a history of um, how we landed on this design. Um, we initially submitted our, uh, with DHA to, to be awarded these lots for purchase. We had to submit um, designs um, with them, with the RFP. And we initially submitted um, a few options for an Italian eight. And then after we were awarded the, the property, we met with um, Curtis Park, uh, neighbors and kind of went over our um, our sorry about that um, our proposals and through discussion with them we uh, we heard that um, they would like to see a mansard style roof um, in the neighborhood to um, kind of 
repeat what what's elsewhere and then also uh, mainly because a lot of the applicants were proposing Italian eights um, and they they thought as we agreed um, a variety um, on this new block of development would be nice and so we um, worked with them in a number of meetings um, as well as um, having some online meetings, Zoom meetings with Brittany to, um, to land at this design. And um, we're happy with where it's at currently. Um, we, we understand <coughs> the, um, the staff recommendations and we're always willing to, um, to do what it takes to, to, to get it um, where everybody um, is happy with it and, and it fits well. So we recognize all of those comments we've read through the briefing and the windows and the sliding door in the back, I think was another one. And we are happy to make those changes. Um, so other than that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Um, commissioners, does anyone have any questions for the applicant? No, no, okay, seeing none. Um, Jen, uh, is there anyone from the public um, that uh, you can see that's wishing to speak? Yep, Keith You're, Breyer. Let me, I'm sorry. On. Oh. Keith is there. Let me, um, I'm going to unmute you, Keith, and you can unmute yourself now. You'll have to do it yourself again. <laughs> All right, got it. Um, yep, and let me put the timer on. Okay, when okay. you're ready. Great. Uh, Keith Pryor here, um, 2418 Champa Street. Uh, Chair of the Curtis Park Design Review Committee. Um, yes, we've worked with uh, Megan. This is just a great collaboration. Um, this design, uh, we're really excited about it. Um, we really feel that uh, it reflects the mansards in the neighborhood, which we have quite a few of. Um, and there are quite a few on this end of the neighborhood as well. They're definitely scattered throughout the neighborhood, but this really does truly reflect uh, a modern interpretation of what one would look like the banding is great. The arched windows on the first floor um, really reflect a lot of the arched windows that are found uh, in this part of the district as well. Um, and so this is just a really strong design um, and we really do like the, uh, how we've addressed the uh, roof on the porch um, and how we've allowed access to an outdoor space up there. Um, so a quick comment for the design on the two paired windows on the second floor in the front. Um, it's not necessarily a mullion as it is a spacer between those two windows. Typically we see a six inch spacer between the paired windows in most of the homes. And so it's not necessarily a mullion as much as a spacer. Um, but, you know, as Brittany said, that could reflect more of a uh, modern uh, take today to reflect its, its period. Um, but uh, we love the brick banding um, that is found there on 26th and it really does pull in those details, uh, which are also very important in Curtis Park is, is the subtle details. So definitely wanna recommend uh, approval of this. Um, we're very excited to see this project move forward and we uh, would like staff to, or uh, the commission to uh, approve this project for mass and scale and the, also the administrative adjustment on height. Height is critical. They have the raised porch foundation. And so that is very critical for the district. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Keith. Um, staff, do you have any anything that you would like to, to, to uh, all righty. Um, yeah, at this I don't point, see, I don't is see there any anyone personal else? Comments, no. Oh, sorry, I forgot to ask. Ah. <laughs> all right, um, since there aren't any questions for staff, we'll go ahead and go into deliberation at this point. Um, commissioners, what do you think? I'll jump in and just say as a, a fellow Mansard dweller um, that it was exciting to see a, a new <laughs> with this roof style. I, I commend the, the owners and developers for, for looking at something that is definitely historic but unique here in town. So, um, you know, I agreed with the staff report. Um, I feel like a lot of good points were made and it'd be exciting to see phase two come back with some of the details. I had just one friendly comment. The way that the gutters and downspouts are shown from the upper mansard roof uh, mm -hmm. is something I think with a creative use of a drip edge or something like that might simplify. Again, just a friendly comment there, but um, otherwise I felt like this was a, a great 
mass inform and and am in support of it. Great, Graham. Thank you. Um, anyone else? This is Brad. I, I um, agree with with uh, Graham. I think that uh, I support mass inform. I think they've done a really nice job. Um, relating this back to the historic context that's existing in the neighborhood. Um, from the height and bulk plane issue, I'm supportive of that. I think that's um, something that is uh, more contextual. It's a good relationship to what's there in the, in the neighborhood already. Um, the, you know, the window mullion, not getting into details and everything, but for me, looking at that mullion detail on the upper level or that spacer bar, I. I liked the fact that this appears to be taking a little bit of a more modern twist on the detailing, especially on the upper level and those projections that are framing the windows. So I think um, I wasn't so concerned with that. It'd be, it's going to be a good and interesting detail to kind of work through. And then there was a comment from staff about um, the front arched windows and the, the um, where the single hung you know bar is versus you know that proportional relationship and i think that's it's a good comment it'd be a good one to study with the brick banding because i think the the precedent image we looked at that brick banding aligned with that that um single hung um horizontal so maybe that's something to study as you're trying to to understand those proportions and dial those in and getting getting them accurate that's all i have Okay, great. Brad, anyone else? This is Erin. I agree with everything that's been said, but I also wanted to commend the applicant on a very clear presentation. I thought the application uh, was presented really nicely, especially the street sections with the comparison. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to commend you for that and say excellent job. Thanks, Erin. Gary, Ann, either of you wish to weigh in? Uh, this is Gary. I support what's been said, and I agree it's an excellent presentation. Um, and I will support the recommended motion. I think this was a, a very good effort on the part of the, um, the designer and the developer and commend their cooperation with the local neighborhood organization. And I agree with everyone. I think it's a terrific project. And I also just think the block itself is going to be so exciting because I remember seeing the Italianate that we looked at last week. And I just think the mix of these different houses is going to make it look like a real neighborhood. But I agree. I think the applicant did just a great job. So well done. Um, I agree. For the record, I, I agree, especially about the um, I, I am really excited to see what uh, transpires. Um, so commissioners, do I hear a motion? This is Brad. I can pull together a motion. Great. All right. I've moved to recommend an administrative adjustment for height and bulk plane per section 12.4.5.3 of the Denver Zoning Code and conditionally approve application 2020-COA-422 for the phase one mass form and context at 3043 Stout Street as per design guidelines 4.1 through 4.5. 4.7 through 4.8, 4.15, 4.18 through 4.19, character defining features of the Curtis Park Historic District, presented testimony, submitted documentation, and information provided in the staff report. Brad, thank you. Is there a second? I'll second. Graham, thank you. All right, we'll do the roll call vote then. Brad? Aye. Aaron? Aye. Graham? Hi. Gary? Hi. Ann? Hi. And Julie uh, votes aye as well. The motion passes. Congratulations and thank you. Um, the next design review project is 2020 COA 336 uh, at 439 William Street. And it's Brittany again. One second. <laughs> No worries, you're fine. So the applicant is requesting um, the commission reconsider uh, their condition that dormers be eliminated from the garage structure on this proposal. 
Um, the commission previously reviewed this um, application and recommended conditional approval with the condition um, that uh, the dormers be eliminated um, from the garage structure. And the applicants also revised the design of the sunroom on the south elevation of the structure. Um, so this is revisions to a previously approved application. All other changes um, in the application packet um, have already been reviewed and approved uh, by the commission. Um, so today we're just looking at that dormer request and the um, sunroom addition. Uh, but this structure is located within the Driving Park Historic District. Um, it is a contributing structure. Um, you can see uh, the structure here on the William Street um, Parkway. Um, so here we have the uh, garage stair addition um, and the proposed sunroom addition, which is 138 square feet. Um, again, that garage is proposed to be connected um, to an existing rear addition. Um, the commission did approve that massing at the uh, last review of this application. Um, so again, we're just looking at these dormers here today. Um, so the applicant um, is um, still requesting the same dormers. The dormers will be located on the north and west roof slope of the uh, recently approved garage. During uh, past commission discussion, there was concern that the garage our roof was overly complicated and not typical of the surrounding historic context. However, some commissioners felt that the dormers were not visible from the public right of way and therefore had minimal visual impact on the surrounding historic uh, context. Um, the applicant has also provided additional examples um, regarding the dormers. Uh, our design guidelines do talk about that uh, new garages or secondary structures should be compatible with the surrounding historic context. Um, garage forms within the driving park historic district are typically of simple design. Um, however, it's not unusual to see um, uh, dormers on the um, on the uh, garage roof form. This typically happens in carriage houses that are located in this area. Um, there are not uh, many of them, but there are a few. So um, staff weren't overly concerned um, with the addition of the uh, dormers on the garage roof form on these elevations as they weren't visible from the public right away um, and located on the north and west roof slope behind the primary massing. Um, again, the proposed height is also within typical ranges, so they are not adding any additional height to the garage. So um, staff weren't concerned about the addition of the garage dormers. So they, um, again, the applicant is just asking that the commission reconsider that decision. Um, the applicant has also redesigned the sunroom. Um, here you can see that proposed sunroom that will be located on the south elevation. Um, the previous sunroom design was a glass structure and staff had lots of concerns that it wasn't typical of uh, sunroom additions to a craftsman style structure. Um, staff did recommend at that time that a panel um, gl gl glass sunroom may be appropriate. Um, we weren't overly concerned with the placement of this, the sunroom addition as a fairly small side addition and will be a set back 16 feet from the facade. Um, however, due to the placement of this structure on the site, it will have um, significant visibility from the public right of way. So we are um, concerned about its uh, design. Um, so the revi revised design is for a brick structure. Um, it will have uh, cottage style windows, which are similar to the window um, on the front facade of this craftsman style structure. It does not have divided lights. Um, in the proposed windows. Um, however, staff feel that this proposed sunroom addition is too solid and additional glazing could be added. Um, at this time, uh, it's unclear to us if the divided lights um, will be a simulated divided light without a spacer bar. The materials submitted by the applicant do um, show a simulated divided light that doesn't have the spacer bar and we do require that spacer bar in all of our applicant um, uh, 
for all of our applications that are proposing a simulated divided light. So the dormer windows, if the commission does decide that the dormers are appropriate, will also need to have that spacer bar and so will the um, sunroom ad addition windows. Um, the applicant has provided examples of a sunroom addition and you can see that that sunroom addition is um, more similar to what staff suggested during the last commission review of the structure um, being a wood structure with a significant amount of glazing. Um, so at this time, uh, staff are recommending approval with conditions. Um, and those conditions are that the, um, oh, my apologies, I forgot to mention this. On the elevation, I'm sorry, this is not going the right way. <laughs> on uh, the north elevation, um, the applicant has removed uh, the demolition of this porch wall. However, the notation is still there. Um, so we are requesting that the plans be updated to just remove that notation regarding uh, demolition of the porch wall and the step addition there as is it no longer part of the project. Um, revise the um, design of the sunroom to have additional glazing slash greater expanses of glazing to be more compatible with sunroom additions for craftsman style buildings and confirm that the dormer windows um, are simulated divided lights with a spacer bar. Thank you. Um, are there any questions for staff from the commissioners? Doesn't look like it. Um, it. Jen is the applicant. Yep, moving them over. And um, the gentleman who had his hand raised, I'm moving over as well because he's a property owner. I just somehow just muted myself. Um, terrific. Uh, could we, uh, those here to speak for the application or for the applicants, um, please state your name and address before speaking, please. They're not all moved. Hold on. They're not. Okay, cool. Sorry, this is um, Emily and my husband Tom is here with me. Um, and we just want to thank the committee as a whole for reviewing our project. We um, both grew up outside of Chicago in historic areas and have a high regard um, for maintaining and holding true to the historic character of our home. So we've been working on this project since March and we're trying really hard to, you know, keep with the rules and the regulations of the Driving Park Historic District. Um, we hired Pat Cashin as our architect, um, mostly because he's had 30 plus years of experience preserving historic homes in urban neighborhoods. Um, and he was also the original architect who did a renovation of this home 15 plus years ago. Um, so we've personally driven and walked high to Lafayette four through six and really looked at how um, bungalows appear from the streets, from the alleys. We've looked at the dormers on the garages and Pat presented you with a few of the pictures. You know, we took additional pictures of like 14 plus homes that, that have the dormers. Um, and we just felt like that kind of matched our existing, our existing home. Um, and maybe Pat can speak a little bit more. I'm, I'm not the expert on the spacer bars and those things. I, I see no problem with that. Um, and we're, you know, we're happy to add or, or make the adjustments necessary for, for the materials. So we hope that the second time around um, that you're seeing kind of um, the changes and the comments and concerns that you had um, and that this, this proposal will meet your expectations. So thanks again. Um, thank you. Could you, um, before you go, could you please give your address for the records? Of course, 439 William Street. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Is there anyone else to speak for the applicant? Jen, do we have somebody else that wants to speak? Yeah, Pat, um, if you want, Pat Cashin, if you'd like to speak, you're welcome to, uh, I think you have to unmute yourself still. Okay, is that good now? Yeah, yes, okay, can we uh, please get your name and uh, address for the record, please? 
Uh, Patrick Cashin, uh, my office is at 2160 South Milwaukee Street in Denver. Thank um, you. Just to make a couple of comments from the discussion. Um, the garage is the same height with or without the dormers. We, you know, there's no increase in the height because the dormers are there. The, the peak of the roof would, is in the same spot. Um, as far as the sunroom, uh, we certainly can add windows. It's probably a, a narrow set of uh, a double, double hung, two, a pair of double hung windows on the east and west sides. And I would think four to five double hung windows on the south side to retain the proportion of uh, the rest of the first floor double hung windows. Uh, some of those windows have um, divided lights. Um, it seemed to be, um, when I looked at those uh, additional windows, it seemed to get a little busy, but I will certainly defer to staff on what uh, the, the best choice would be there. Um, all the other conditions are workable. That note about the uh, uh, north porch wall, that's an inadvertent mouse click that occurs every now and then. And uh, I think the only other request I would make is that if, if um, we could bring these back, uh, these changes back to staff, uh, that would certainly help us uh, move things along. Thank you. Do are, uh, are any of the commissioners have a question for the applicants? No? All right. Um, are there any, um, so let's, oh, the members of the public are welcome to comment for up to two minutes per person. If you're joining by computer, please raise your hand. If you're joining by phone, please email landmark at denvergov.org with name, phone number, and um, do we have anybody um, wishing to speak from the public, Jen? No emails, and I don't see any hands raised. Okay, great. All right, seeing no uh, public comments. Um, Brittany, does, do you, does the staff have any redirect? Um, we do feel that the window proportions don't have to be exactly similar to the window proportions on the house. If you look at um, some of the, uh, the sunroom examples, usually the sunroom has a greater expanse of glazing. So we do feel comfortable that we could work with um, Pat to adjust that window glazing and proportions um, if the commission had concerns. Okay, great. Thank you, Brittany. Um, All righty, then um, the commission will go into deliberation. Commissioners, what do you think? Oh, sorry, Ann. Sorry, could I just ask a question of Brittany? I just wasn't Brittany. fast enough. Oh, go ahead, go for it. The, the example that's shown at 416 North Humboldt, which is on sheet 16, that garage, is that garage um, a contributing feature? Is that a contributing um, garage? Or can you tell, can you tell so, us anything about it? So yeah. all of these examples are in the Driving Park Historic District. Um, secondary structures are not identified as contributing or non-contributing within the Driving Park Historic District. Um, it is a, a historic carriage house, um, but it, again, it's not identified as contributing or non-contributing. But, but um, it is a it is original architect. We're, what we're looking at is an architecture um, within the period of significance. Is that correct? It is. It does have some material modifications to it, but it is within the period of significance. Great. Thanks, Brittany. Any other questions for staff? All right. Then let's go into deliberation. Uh, commissioners, um, opinions, thoughts? Julie, I'll jump in and say that I think the sunroom, um, I agree with staff's comments about the, the visibility and the openness um, based mm -hmm. on our guideline for windows. And, uh, but I do just want to acknowledge that I think as a form um, on the whole, based on the first arrangement that we saw that had a, a gabled roof that came back against the house, I, I really think that it, it took a step in, in the right direction. Um, and I think that that compatibility uh, is a real positive thing. So, you know, with the staff's um, and Brittany's uh, discussion about the the windows and working through those details, I know the triple window, which is mentioned, is a, a character defining feature. But I I feel like this type of addition or even this type of bay window 
something very common in the craftsman style. And so I, I feel comfortable with that piece of it if we want to maybe start with sunroom and then talk garage or, or however we want to divide it up. But um, yeah, I wanted to point out, I think, a, a great step forward from our from our last uh, review on the sunroom. Yeah, I do agree. So let's, I like your idea. Let's start with comments on, on the sunroom. I think that's probably the best way to divide this up. Anybody have comments on the sunroom? Gary, you're muted. I was unmuted. There, okay. There you go. Perfect. Um, I agree with uh, staff comments on the sunroom. Um, I, you know, the, the way it's presented, it just looks way too heavy um, of a structure to be considered a sunroom. And in, and in that regard, it becomes somewhat incompatible as an addition to the style of main building. So, you know, I think if the masonry stopped at the sill level and then uh, wood trim and framing and additional windows from the sill level up would be a great improvement and make it read like a sunroom. Okay. Um, other comments? This is this is Brad. I, I'm in agreement. Um, I, I don't think the sunroom is reading quite like a sunroom. I don't know the exact way to to um, approach it, but I do think that the glazing there's not enough glazing, and it had, does have a, a heavy feel to it. I do think if it it um, if the glazing is increased, the shed roof and the simple form would work really well. It just needs to be um, detailed and uh, material you know material study. A number of windows to understand how you lighten that up so it really feels like a sunroom. Okay, Brad, thanks. Anne, I, I agree. I agree with everybody. I think it's a, it's a much, it's a much more successful form than the previous version. And there is definitely a way of making it look like a sunroom and also making it look like an appropriate addition to a craftsman home, which I think was the problem before. So it seems. It, I think going. I could definitely agree with going with staff's recommendation that the form remain in place, but that the fenestration um, becomes more glassy. And I like Gary's idea that the masonry basically stops at the sill line. I think that that could be very successful. And thank you, Erin, did you have anything? All right, okay. Um, let's move on then to the garage with the dormers. Um, commissioners, what do you think about re-examining the dormers. Anne? So um, I'm sorry that Erica's not here this time because yeah. I think that she was the person who was very articulate about the potential issue with this. And it came, it, it's exactly the same, it's the same design. So it has the same, issues that we talked about. So the where this came in was looking at um, um, in section 4.19 about impact on the alley. And it's sort of, I think, begin, be, is an issue. It says, when structures of the rear generally have little impact on the character of the street, they do have an impact on the character of the alley and the neighbors to the rear. A subordinate character should be maintained. And that's where we were before. And I don't really see anything that would make me personally not agree with that particular statement. So I just think it seems very fussy. Now, um, it is very, it's interesting to see an historic uh, version of this. Um, mm -hmm. I guess I'm kind of curious how many there are because otherwise I think in general, the character of an alley, and this is true of almost all secondary structures we've seen, including um, ADUs, is generally much more subordinate and quiet. All right, and thank you. Um, Brad, Graham, Gary, Aaron. This is, this is Brad. I mean, I, I guess um, I might have missed that that last time we reviewed this, but um, I guess I don't, I don't because it is to the back and, and I don't understand the, um, well, 
you know, look, looking Anne, at, at the comments you just made, it would, it would, I don't know how this affects the property across the street. If that property is pulled back, it seems like these are um, on the back side of the house. They're hidden behind the house. If it was an ADU, but I'm just talking out loud, it would be taller. Obviously, this looks like it's actually pretty, pretty short addition to the top, and it doesn't change the height of the roof at all. Um, so I, I guess I don't have the same reaction that it sounds like um, folks had during the last review, the same initial reaction. I, I remember we were split and there was a mm -hmm. lot of good conversation, like Ann mentioned, mm -hmm. and Erica had yeah. some, some strong points the last time. Um, you know, I think that the applicants have shown that there's, you know, similar historic configurations in the vicinity and um, so I, I don't have a strong opinion against allowing the dormers based on the guidelines and historic compatibility, um, but that's my two cents. Okay, thank you, Graham. Gary, Aaron. Um, this is Gary, I, I agree. Um, I might have been a little bit ambivalent last time. Um, and I think uh, the applicant has demonstrated that there are some precedents for this reform with the gables. So I, I won't object to them. Aaron, thanks, Gary. Aaron, I have no concerns about the gables on the garage myself. Okay. Uh, well, it sounds um, sounds like we're getting close to a motion. Um, do I hear a motion from the commissioners? Sorry. Yeah, Madam Chair, I will um, move to conditionally approve the revised application number 2020-COA-336 for the garage dormers and sunroom at 439 William Street as per design guidelines 3.1, 3.2, 3.5 through 3.8, and 4.19 character defining features for the Driving Park Historic District, presented testimony, submitted documentation, and information provided in the staff report with the following conditions. One, update the plans to remove the note on page seven regarding porch wall demolition and step mm -hmm. addition. Number two, revise the design of the sunroom to have additional glazing and or greater expanses of glazing to be more compatible with the sunroom addition design for craftsman style buildings. And number three, confirm that dormer windows on the garage are provided with a simulated divided light spacer bar. All right, thank you, Graham. Is there a, a second from the commissioners? I'll second that. Gary, thank you. Um, we will go ahead and do uh, another roll call vote. Um, Brad? Aye. Aaron? Aye. Graham? Aye. Gary? Aye. Ann? Aye. And uh, Julie is aye as well. The motion passes unanimous, unanimously. The applicant will uh, get together with Brittany and, and work together on that. So that'll be great. Thank you very much to the applicant. And to, um, so we are on to our next. I, uh, I have a quick, oh, this is Jen. I have a quick question. Okay. I didn't hear Graham was an aye. So yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Just making sure. I'm quiet okay. in front of a computer. <laughs> He's a very quiet guy. Yeah. Okay. So our next design review project uh, is 2019 COA 063 2844 California Street. And again, it's Brittany, busy, busy lady. <laughs> so our next project is um, for retroactive approval to infield alterations to a new. Um, development within the Curtis Park Historic District. Here is a rendering of the proposed project. The Landmark Preservation Commission uh, approved the mass form and context in December of 2018 and the design details in March of 2019. Um, staff has done some administrative revisions to this project as well. Um, however, the alterations that were made in the field could not be administratively reviewed by staff. Um, and we will see why here in a second. 
Um, so here's a um, image of the proposed uh, development. Um, there are no concerns over the front elevations. Um, however, the applicant is requesting retroactive approval um, for faux wood grain siding that was installed on the rear elevation of the primary structure, structure uh, which you can see here um, in this elevation, and also uh, retroactive approval to alterations to the uh, rail design for the rear um, stoop. It's uh, still the same railing material. It's just a simplified handrail. Um, our guidelines uh, do talk about how uh, materials should be uh, similar to those that are seen historically in the surrounding context. And 4.6F specifically says, do not use fiber cement board that was detailed to resemble wood grain. Um, so the applicant is requesting retroactive approval for that wood grade siding on the rear of the primary structure and all elevations of the garage structures. So each one of these um, townhomes has their own separate garage. Um, well, sorry, there are three separate garages that each have uh, that wood grain siding on all elevations. Um, so here are the elevations. I've bubbled um, those changes to the material notations. Here you can see images of the faux wood grain siding that were taken by our inspector. <laughs> Um, this is an image uh, provided by the applicant. Um, you can see that simplified railing design. It doesn't have any um, balustrades. Uh, staff aren't concerned about the alterations to the railing design. However, we're very concerned about this faux wood grain siding, which you can see a manufacturer specification there. It's um, James Hardy uh, uh, faux grain wood siding. Um, the approved plan set uh, clearly does identify that the material should be a smooth finish and the uh, certificate of appropriateness also states that it should be a smooth um, finish. So we are very concerned about the installation of that faux wood crane siding. Um, in addition to alterations to the railing and material cladding for the rear facade and the garages, there are some discrepancies with the fence design and placement. Um, so here we have the site plan um, showing the placement of the fence. Um, so the fence is intended to be uh, per the landmark approved plans and the plan submitted for commission review today. All the fencing is proposed to be in the rear of the property. There is no fencing shown forward of the primary facade. However, when the inspector went out to the site along the north property line, there was horizontal fencing installed forward of the primary facade. Um, staff did advise the applicant that we do not allow horizontal fencing in locations with a high level of visibility and that there were a couple of ways that the fencing could be rectified. However, it would need to be shown properly on plan. Um, on, in late in December, um, staff were informed by the architect that the um, developer had corrected the fencing and installed vertical uh, uh, fencing forward of the primary facade with a 50% um, opening uh, pattern in that fencing. However, that is still not shown in the site plan and all fencing needs to be properly identified in the site plan. Um, additionally, there is both a mixture of uh, horizontal and vertical fencing on this site and the plans that submitted for commission review today only show a vertical fence uh, detail, which you can see here. And then finally, um, the fencing is located um, at the, um, at the uh, forward edge of the garages and there are gates that are located on each side of the garages in plan. However, as installed, there is fencing along the alley. So I do have photographs that show all of this. Um, so here is the initial um, fencing that the inspector found when they went out to the site. As you can see, it's a horizontal fencing. Uh, this fencing here that you see um, is forward of the primary facade. Um, so again, uh, staff um, in indicated to the applicant how this fencing could be rectified, but also indicated several times that it would need to be shown on plan. 
Um, that fencing was adjusted. However, it's still not accurately shown on plans. So we do need plans that show this fencing here forward of the primary facade and also confirming that this fencing is four feet in height and 50% open. Um, you can see that that gate, which was initially constructed horizontally, was um, changed to a vertical orientation. Um, here we have uh, some horizontal fencing. This is behind um, the, uh, the gate that you just saw in the previous image along the north property line. We do allow horizontal fencing where it has limited visibility from the public right away. So we're not concerned that this fencing is horizontal in orientation. However, again, the plans only indicate a vertical fence. So if this vertical or sorry, if this horizontal fence is to remain, we need plans that show also horizontal fencing. Uh, this is the fencing along the south property line, um, which is uh, vertical in nature. And then here we have uh, the gates at the garages, which are horizontal in nature and installed along the alley as, a as opposed to the location indicated in the site plan, which indicates that they will be on the um, interior facade of the garage. So again, the fence location just needs to be clearly shown and plan um, so we can confirm that the fencing meets our design standards and guidelines. So at this time, staff are recommending approval with conditions, with the condition that the siding trim and fascia materials all be a smooth finish, cementitious material, and that the installed fencing be accurately shown in plan and be no taller than six feet in height for the rear yard and at least 50% open and no taller than 48 inches for the front yard. All right, Brittany, thank you. Um, Commissioner, do you have any questions for Brittany? No? Okay, great. Um, is the applicant present? Jen, do you know? Yes. The yeah. applicant is present, and Emily yep. just moved to I just over. moved down. Great. Thanks, Emily. Um, yep. The applicant, you have 10 minutes. Um, please state your name and your address before beginning. Thank you. So this is Ty, Ty is the um, Ty, okay. Yep, and we were having audio issues earlier. So it was working for a minute there. Yeah, yeah we're not hearing you, Ty. Great. There you go. Uh, okay. There you go. All right, Ty, please, your, your full name and address before beginning. Ty Mumford uh, with Don Development. Um, we agree with everything that Brittany said. Um, the only reason that the drawings haven't been revised to reflect the current state of the fence that has been corrected per staff's recommendations is Paul Marquis, the architect, didn't want to be submitting multiple different plans if we had to make more changes after today. Um, so we can't get those resubmitted uh, to display what's accurate in the field. Uh, our comment about the siding, and Brittany, I don't know if you can show this, but I've submitted a dozen photos that we disagree with the extent of the quote unquote wood grain, because if you look at the pictures that I've submitted of both adjoining neighbors at, from a 10 foot distance, you cannot tell that our, our siding is in fact textured, but you can definitely tell that our neighbors are completely textured. Um, we understand that a mistake has been made here. Our, our, our request would be that we be allowed to, um, redo the siding only in the areas that you can actually see because there's nowhere from any angle that you can see the back of the house to be anything but smooth. Whereas our neighbors, you can see from 50 feet away, like that picture right there. Can anyone see any of the very light, light texture on that? And my comment would be no, no, no one will ever from the public see any siding striations on that. And so our, our uh, request would be that we only change the, the garage area that can be seen from the alley to, the, to a, a, a smooth texture board. Um, and as far as the, the, the fences on the back, we will show those. It's a terrible homeless problem over there. We had to put those there. We had people just living in between these garages. We couldn't 
allow that to continue. So we had to move those fences toward the alley. All right. Is that, is that all that you'd like to say, Ty? Yeah, I, I'd submitted almost 10 different photos that you can clearly see our neighbor's siding is is very, very extreme as far as the the texture. And you can't like that picture there. You can't tell that ours has any, you know, anything but smooth siding there. And that's from standing on the alley line. Uh, Brittany, do you know what happened to all the other photos I submitted? These are all the photos I received from you over the entire time period. We had had discussions regarding this project. So now, the ones I sent you a month ago clearly show the neighbor to the south and how they've got a true textured uh, LP product on the south there. Um, so you mentioned those properties, um, but you never provided photographs to me. And I also asked for their addresses so I could research those. So back on, let's see, looks like November 17th, I sent you photos that you said you would put in. Um, yeah, here's the photos I sent you back on November 17th, showing the neighbor's properties. Um, I'll send them to you again right now. It's just a much more extreme, when we think of textured siding, we think of of this LP product that's that you can see from a mile away. And when you hold it side by side between the siding we installed and the siding that's on both of our neighbor's properties, you can't even tell that ours is textured at all. And theirs is definitely textured. And that's why we would just propose that anything that's visible from the alley, we're willing to swap out, but we'd like to not have to rip the back face of the, uh, the house off leading to potential water damage and no one can tell that it's not perfectly smooth. All right, um, is there anyone else to speak with the applicant tires it just you today? No, just me. Okay, great. Um, anything else you'd like to say? No, I forwarded Brittany the photos I'd sent her on November 17th that show the two neighbors and that's about all I have. Okay, um, our commissioners, do you have any questions for our applicant? All right, uh, seeing none. Um, Jennifer, do we have anybody for public comment? See any hands raised? Um, and there are no emails. All right. Um, Staff, would you like uh, to redirect the discussion? Anything you'd like to say? Um, so again, I did ask for the addresses of those adjacent properties so I could research um, why they have faux wood grain siding as indicated by the applicant. I haven't been provided that address, so I cannot speak to why it has faux grain wood siding. Um, however, I do know we review all projects against our current design standards and guidelines, which state um, do not use uh, faux grain wood siding. All right, Brittany, any commissioners have any further questions for staff? All right, then, uh, seeing none, we will go into deliberation. Commissioners, um, your thoughts? So, hold on. Um, Keith just raised his hand, and, oh, okay. but he missed the public comment period. So if you guys are willing to he hear public comment, then uh, well, I'm willing to, before I, you go yeah. to deliberation. Sure, absolutely. Let's let it. Hi, Keith. Hold on a second. Uh, all right, you can unmute yourself when you're ready, Keith. Sorry about that. My computer decided to lose its internet. Um, <laughs> yeah. Right in an inter-opportune moment. So Keith Pryor here, uh, 2418 Champa Street. Uh, design review chair of uh, the Curtis Park Design Review Committee. Um, definitely agreeing with staff's uh, recommendations here. I do definitely understand uh, where the applicant is coming from. And uh, I think he might have a good solution as far as the proposal, because you don't really see the back of the property um, 
because the, the garages do actually block that and, and it is a, um, we do like smooth grain and we do request that there is no wood growing grain or faux grain uh, in the situation. Um, so definitely where the garages are affected, uh, we would definitely want those to be replaced where it is visible from the alley. Um, but given that the, the alley is, the back of the property is, is very clearly concealed, I would, I would leave that to the commission to decide uh, where they wanna go with that. Um, those gates, um, if they were to remain, um, I like how they did frame out the gates. Uh, the horizontal treatment of the panels uh, is not typically found in the district. And so I do appreciate them being framed and very nice. Uh, and it is a very high end gate. Um, I do have a little bit of concern with the verticality or the horizontalness of that. And if there is a way to frame that in and still do a vertical element, uh, given how visible it is, um, on the alley and we always do have precedents and people pointing to other projects uh, to refer and so that's our only concern with that uh, moving forward so that you know we can definitely say that uh, the verticality was addressed as well as the faux grain from what you can visibly see from the public realm. So those are my comments. Um, I do appreciate staff work on this uh, and them going out uh, to address the issue. Thank you. Thanks Keith. All right, Brittany, did you want to redirect after the comment? Um, I, d I don't have any redirect. I did add um, those photos that the applicant mentioned to okay. the LPC presentation folder. If Jen wanted to pull those up for the commission to review. I, I don't have access to that. <laughs> so if you want to share your screen, you can do that. I, um, I have okay. enabled you to share your screen. Sure, be great. Let me figure out how to do this. <laughs> Hold on, I'm not quite sure what I'm doing. I just stopped sharing. And I think you just have to pull it up and then share your screen. Should work. Yep. Yeah, there you go. So um, this is the garage structure. This is the adjacent structure siding, which I don't um, know why specifically it has overing wood siding. They're not, all we see is your folder, not. Oh, okay. <laughs> Great. <laughs> so here is the um, garage structure, the rear facade, and the adjacent structure. I'm not quite sure how to share multiple photos at a time. Is that, yep. do you see the rear facade? Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, I think those are probably the most two relevant photographs provided by the applicant. Okay. Commissioners, do you have any other further questions to staff before we? Just one question, Brittany. Um, the back wall of the building has the faux grain, but the garages do as well. Is the consideration for all siding garages and back wall of the building? Yes, the commission has um, not approved faux grain wood siding in any application since we adopted our recent design standards and guidelines. Perfect. Thanks for clarifying. Okay. Thanks, Brittany. All right. Any other questions? All right, then we will move into deliberation. Commissioners, um, let me know what you think. Don't all talk at once. Julie, this is Brad. I think, you know, one way to start the conversation is kind of talking about the fence and the handrail. Sure. Um, so I didn't have any um, concerns with the, the design of the fence. I agree with staff that it seems like 
we just need to get that documented. I understand there's been some changes and it sounds like they worked through those. There was a question about the handrail off the back. Um, the railing design, I think I agree with staff that that's okay. I don't think there's, it's very simple um, design and I don't think it really detracts from anything. So I was in agreement with staff on those two items as a starting point. Okay, great. Anybody else have any thoughts about the fencing and the grade? No, I agree with Brad on that one. I think those are the straightforward okay. ones. Yeah, <laughs> I, I agree. Anyone else? I think unfortunately that the other is, is straightforward based on our, our precedent and our rules, but it's a bigger conversation. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, well, then let's go on to the, uh, to the other part of that. Um, shall we talk about the siding? Any comments? Um, this is Brad again. I'll, I'll follow up and start the conversation, rip the Band-Aid off here. But as yeah. um, Graham said, it's been really clear in the guidelines. So it's not, you know, it's, it's a guideline for six, uh, 4.6F. Um, and it talks specifically about fiber cement siding too. And some of those examples that we're looking at were probably like a LP and engineered wood product, but it's very specific. It's very clear. And I think it's, um, these are really difficult situations, but that's what the guidelines state. And we have uh, been very consistent about how we applied that, I think on other projects. Thank you, Brad. Gary, Ann, Aaron. This is Gary. I, I agree with what Brad just said. You know, uh, smooth is smooth, and it's and, um, the guidelines are clear, and all of our deliberations on other projects regarding uh, cement fiber siding have been clear that uh, smooth is what's been approved. And um, you know, um, I just I just really worried about um, starting to um, create a precedent that. Sometimes it's okay and sometimes it's not. Um, I think we have to be uh, uh, strict uh, with the guidelines in this case. All right, thank you, Gary. Eric? Yeah, I'm in agreement with what everyone said that it's what the design guidelines state and that's what we have said in the past. And All right. Um, I agree. Uh, the design guidelines are pretty clear, as is our record. Um, do I hear a motion from the commissioners? Madam Chair, I can make the motion. Thank you, Ann. Um, Madam Chair, I move to conditionally, I, I move to a conditionally approve revised application number 2019-COA-063 for the in the field alterations made to the approved infill row house development at 2844 California Street as per design guidelines 4.17, presented testimony, submitted documentation and information provided in the staff report with the following conditions. One, siding, trim and fascia materials to be smooth finish cementitious material per design guideline 4.6.F and two, installed fencing to be accurately shown in plan and no taller than six feet in height for the rear yard and at least for the rear yard and at least 50% open and no taller than 48 inches in the front yard per design guideline 5.8 and 5.9. Thank you, Ann. Is there a second? I'll second. Gary, thank you. Then we will do a roll call vote. Brad? Aye. Aaron? Aye. Graham? Aye. Gary? Aye. Ann? Aye. And Julie uh, votes aye as well, and the motion has passed. All right, then. Our next project in the design review projects is 2020-COA-432 at 3025 Newton Street, and that is as Abby. Hello. Hi. Okay, so uh, final design review of the day. So this is 3025 Newton. It is a Queen Anne style residence constructed circa 1886. 
I was constructed within the period of significance of the Wolf Place District. And while it has undergone some alterations, staff still finds that it retains sufficient integrity to be considered a contributing resource to the district. The most significant alteration has been the covering of the building in stucco, including the encapsulation of much of the original exterior trim, but the historic form remains intact. Uh, based on Sanborn maps, as you see here, uh, the house has been in its current form since at least 1904, uh, which includes a historic rear addition. Okay, so you can see here the existing property on the left and then the proposals for alterations on the right. So there are quite a few items under review today. Uh, the applicant is proposing to demolish the rear wall of the house and a non-historic rear porch uh, to then replace that with a new side and rear addition uh, to replace all the windows uh, which includes non-historic vinyl windows, as well as 15 historic wood windows, to construct a new front porch, to replace the front door, to add a side patio and a new door opening on the north, uh, to replace an existing chain link fence at the side yard, to demolish the existing historic garage, and to construct a new garage. Here you see the site plan. Uh, so the, and it's the, the solid is the existing building. Um, the diagonal lines show the new addition and the new garage. Um, so the applicant is proposing a rear and side addition that will wrap around the northwest corner of the property. While an addition completely to the rear is preferred under landmark guidelines, uh, the site addition is set back more than 36 feet from the facade, is less than 10 feet wide, and is simple in design. The applicant is requesting a side and rear yard addition rather than addition that extends solely to the rear in order to retain their existing backyard garden. Um, this is also the reason that they are proposing to move the garage further to the north on the lot, the current garage is located more directly behind the existing house and the new garage is going, is supposed to be pushed further into the side yard. Oops, sorry, controls a little challenging sometimes. Okay, so here you see the existing facade of the house um, showing the changes to the facade will just be a window replacement um, and then there you see the proposed um, side addition. Um, so the proposed addition is simple in form. Um, it will be a kind of a cross gable form to the existing front gabled roof. It will be dropped down one foot from the existing roof peak. Uh, the historic portion of the house will remain dominant and visually identifiable. Uh, the two story gabled form matches out of the primary residence. The addition will add irregularity to the footprint of the historic structure, but irregular footprints are common on Queen Anne structures. The addition will be clad in stucco, which will match the primary residence. The placement of the windows on the addition will align with the historic structure, though the addition windows are wider than those found on the historic structure. Oops, okay, yeah. Okay, so here you see the side of the house. Um, so again, window replacements on the side, and then there will also be one window opening on the north side that will be um, expanded and kind of, you know, altered in order to hold paired doors leading onto a new side patio. Um, it does not look like the window opening that's going to be altered here is a historic window opening. And since this is set back towards the very you know, rear of the side facade, um, staff finds that this alteration is not going to be readily visible. 
um, and the new side patio feature proposed uh, will be largely obscured uh, by the proposed fencing. Then you can also see here the proposal for the new side cross gables addition there. Um, the cross gable design is compatible with a historic residence. Um, however, the addition does feature a shallower gabled roof than the historic residence, and the eaves of the addition do not align with the eaves of the historic structure. Um, the staff doesn't find, you know, I think you could kind of argue either way on this, either that the fact that it doesn't align and that it has a different roof pitch can either be looked at as, you know, helping to identify it as new construction or as being incompatible with the district character. Um, so I'll leave that up to you uh, to make that determination. However, one thing that is kind of awkward in the proposed design of the roof is that it does have two differing roof pitches. Um, so the, you know, the main property has a 12-12 pitch. And then the east facing roof slope features a self 712 pitch, while the west facing roof slope features a six and a half 12 pitch. And it is not typical for a single roof to you know, feature two different roof pitches. Then here we have the rear of the structure. Um, so the addition does feature an inset at the southwest corner of the first floor with a second story projecting over the first. Um, this is a modern feature that's not characteristic of the district, but this feature will not be visible from public vantage points. And similar features have been approved as part of additions on other properties at the rear where there's not going to be public visibility. Okay, so here you have the garage at the rear. This is a historic garage. Um, it's typical of, you know, historic garages found in the district. Well, it's a good example of a historic type. It is a utilitarian building and does not have any exceptional detailing or other distinguishing features. Uh, located behind the house, the garage is not readily visible within the district and staff does not find the garage to historically contribute to the district. So here is the proposed replacement garage. Um, so this will be moved further to the north than the existing garage. Um, the form is a simple gabled roof form, um, which is compatible with the district. However, the roof of the garage is more steeply pitched than typically found on garages. Um, and due to the placement of the garage in the side yard, the roof will increase the visual prominence of the garage. Uh, staff would recommend replacing the roof with either a lower pitch gable roof or a flat roof. Um, the applicants also proposing a barn style door for the garage, which are not characteristic of the district, having a much more rustic appearance than is typically found in a historic accessory structure. However, the barn doors are on the side and will not have you know, any readily you know, visible perspectives from within the district. So overall, staff finds the proposed design compatible with the district, but we do have some areas that we feel either need some revision or some clarification. Uh, the first of those are on the dimensions of the addition. Um, so the site plan shows the dimensions of the addition as 17 foot 3 inches by um, 28 and a half feet. Um, sorry, no, 28 feet and a half an inch. Um, they also show the addition extending um, eight foot, seven and a half inches to the north of the original structure. However, elevation drawings give a different measurement um, with elevation showing the length of the addition as 16 foot six inches and the addition extending only um, six feet, six inches to the north of the original structure. Um, so I think there just needs to be some more clarity in all the dimensions throughout the application. And there needs to be, you know, go through to make sure that all the measurements throughout the application are consistent. Uh, staff then is also concerned with the dimensions of the proposed replacement windows. 
Um, so the windows on the addition are wider than is typically found in the district. Um, it's window type H that is proposed for the addition, and this measures um, three foot six inches by three foot six inches. Uh, square windows are not typical of the historic district, are the you know, primary historic structure. The historic window openings on the existing house are no wider than three feet. And staff recommend that the window openings on the addition, especially those with public visibility, also be no wider than three feet. Um, the applicant's also proposing to replace all existing windows, including, including 15 historic windows. Uh, professional window evaluation has been completed by Philip Barlow. And based on that evaluation, most of the windows have been found to display advanced deterioration in several areas. Um, so staff believes that they have made a case for needing window replacement. Uh, the proposed replacement windows are aluminum clad wood, matching the overall size, window type, and operation of the historic windows. However, the applicant has not submitted the window comparison form from the landmark window application. So exact measurement comparisons between the existing historic windows and the proposed replacements are not available. So the applicant is then also proposing to construct a new porch on the facade. Um, so Sanborn maps show that there was originally a partial width porch located at the entrance. Um, so staff believes that you know, it's appropriate to restore a porch to this location. Overall, the placement and design of the porch is compatible with the district uh, with a front gable roof supported by simple wood spindle posts. However, the applicant is proposing to clad the gable in with stucco and to add a geometric banding at the base, um, referencing a geometric stucco banding that's also found on the facade. However, this banding is not characteristic of Victorian detailing found in the district, and staff do not believe this detailing is original. Um, to us, it appears that this is a banding that was added when the stucco was applied to the property. Um, as such, staff does not find it appropriate to replicate this non-historic detail. Um, and additionally, having stucco on the end of a front gable porch is not typical of Queen Anne style homes. So staff believes it would be much more appropriate to look at some kind of simple wood detailing in the gable end of the porch, as you see there, the typical porch, which is located on the same block, um, has a wood shingle design in the gable end, which is much more typical of what you would find um, in this style of porch. And then some clarification on the site work and the fence design. Um, so these are just aerial and a current street view shot showing the existing condition. So currently the side yard is contained uh, by a chain, look, chain link fence parallel to the street and then a side wood fence at the property line with kind of a lattice detail at the top. However, these con fence conditions are not re really clearly shown in the application. The application is showing that that front chain link fence is going to be replaced, but it doesn't show any alterations to the side fence. However, it also shows that the side that the Chain link fence location, that's going to be pushed back further from the facade to meet landmark guidelines. Um, so presumably then part of the, the fence is now going to connect in a different place. So presumably part of that side yard fence is going to be demolished. Otherwise, it would be sticking forward of the fence. So that needs to be clarified. Also, the detailing needs to be clarified. This is showing um, that the fence is now going to have Again, kind of a lattice design on top, but this shows a square design that doesn't seem to match what's currently on the side fence. So it's unclear, is that side fence then going to be partially replaced to match the existing? Um, also, you can see here clearly an example that that side fence is quite a bit taller than the front fence, but dimensions and height of that side fence are not provided. Um, so it's unclear, does that side fence meet our height requirements or not? And if that top element is going to be replaced, that needs to be clarified and you know, any fence demolition and alterations to that side fence need to be clarified. Additionally, um, 
there's differences between the site plan and the drawing here. The, this drawing is showing that there's going to be a side walkway that extends from the front, um, the front deck to the side that's not shown on the site plan drawing and staff does not find that appropriate, would recommend removing that. Um, and so there's some differences there. It also shows that the side patio is set back further on the site plan than the drawing. The drawing also shows the patio projecting forward of the new addition, which staff believe should also be edited. So we think what is in the site plan is appropriate and approvable, but that's not what matches the other drawing. So we just need some clarification and to make sure that everything in the application is consistent. Uh, so staff is recommending approval with conditions. Um, so we find the addition um, and porch massing compatible with the historic residence and district. Some details need revision or clarification to ensure that the proportions and design details are compatible with the residents in the district. Um, so first condition recommending reducing the width of the windows on the addition to match the width of the historic window openings. Um, no more than three feet wide um, to clarify the dimensions of the addition on the plans to reduce the pitch of the roof on the garage to clarify the design and placement of the fencing and site work to complete the existing replacement window comparison form uh, for the proposed historic window replacements and to clad the gable end of the porch with wood rather than stucco. Okay. Um, do the commissioners have any questions for the staff? Um, no questions for Abby? Okay. Um, all right. Abby, thank you very much. Um, Jen, is the applicant present? Yep, Emily's moving them over. Okay. Yep. Oh. Hi, um, if you could please, hi, if you could please state your name, uh, names and address, please. Yeah, hi, uh, thanks for having us. My name's Tom Hunt, this is my wife, Margaret. Uh, our address is 3025 Newton Street, this is our house. So um, thanks for, for letting us present this and uh, we figured we just tell a little bit of the story of what we're proposing and why. Um, we moved into this house about four and a half years ago, um, lived in it since then, and, and we were excited to move into a historic neighborhood. It was kind of new for us, but we really were excited about it, and we've loved it. We have great neighbors and, you know, kind of love the old houses and the trees and just the feel for it, and um, want to live here for, I don't know, I, for, I would say forever, but I guess we don't get to control that. Um, so, uh, how we got here, we, we moved into this house one month before we had twins. So at that point we had three children under the age of three about four and a half years ago. And it's taken us since then to kind of get our heads above water, honestly. Um, but now that we have, we've, we've been able to spend some time on this with Abigail. Um, we hired an architect, Nick Young, who I think is on the call as well, if we have any questions. And uh, I've been working with Abigail for a while now. I, I was looking back and I think our first informal consultation with her was six months ago. Uh, and really appreciate all of her involvement in this. It's, she's done a really great job uh, helping us learn all about the landmark guidelines and historic district characteristics and how to match that. And that's certainly our goal here is to build something that works for our family. There's some things in deterioration that I think she mentioned that we knew moving in that just needed to be addressed and, and it's been as long as until we could kind of have the oxygen to do it, but um, also figure out what, you know, how our family uses the house. And, um, so it's been great working with her on that, figure out how to make all that work. Um, what you see here, I think, is the fourth iteration that we propose. Um, in working with her, we've scaled it back significantly and put together, I think, a much simpler application than what we had originally thought. And we think it, it meets all of the landmark guidelines and historic district characteristics and uh, would ask for your approval on it. You know, in terms of why we're pro proposing, you know, what we're proposing, um, you know, I think there's four main things. There's the addition. Um, so we had initially, pro initially proposed an addition to the uh, side, fully to the side. And, and one of the reasons there, I don't know, Abby, if you can show the picture with the side yard, the first one you showed. Um, we do a lot of gardening. I guess you can't quite see it there. It's kind of to the back of the porch. And in the warm months, we grow all of, all of our 
food, you know, all of our vegetable food. Oh, there you go. There's a picture of the garage there. Um, and so, backyard. Yeah, there you go. You can kind of see it. So um, we want to be able to do something that still keeps the sunlight coming from the south so we can do that, that growing during the season. And um, with Abby, I figured out to do this uh, rear addition that wraps around to the side. It's also informed by the fact that it's a kind of an odd lot. We have a really narrow house that's all the way right on the border of the lot on one side of a double lot. And so I had to figure out how to make that fit geometrically. Uh, and, and so over time, I've evolved it to this. Um, we're proposing adding the awning over the, the small part of the front porch. You know, in various iterations, we had a full front porch and even a side porch. Some of that our um, neighborhood association had suggested, but with Abby's guidance, we saw the Sanborn map show that there was the awning, basically what you see now. And so we've just kind of gone for that since that's what's on the Sanborn maps. Um, the window replacements, uh, as she mentioned, we hired Barlow Cultural Resources, Phil Barlow, do the analysis. I think that's the second piece of your application packet. Uh, it showed advanced deterioration on all of the historic windows, and, and most of them, like pretty much all the categories, are in advanced deterioration. He also flagged some pretty significant safety and structural issues for us, so we felt like it was pretty clear that they all needed to be replaced. Um, in doing that, we, we also went ahead and just proposed to re replace all of the vinyl windows that were put in, uh, you know, I don't know, sometime obviously in the past couple of decades. I think that's one of your guidelines is that, you know, we're possible to do that, to kind of get everything unified in the same historic characteristic. And so we wanted to do that here. Uh, another thing we did is there's this, the doors on the side to get to the patio because it is that side yard. We want to be able to access it. And with Abby's guidance, we've kind of moved those doors back and done them where there's that non-historic window opening that was cut into the wall at some point, um, just expanding that opening. Uh, the final thing is replacing the garage. I think you can see in the pictures, it's, it's in pretty badly deteriorated state. Um, the roof's collapsing. The, there's a big chunk of the wall that's gone and it's just covered with sheet metal. Um, windows are out, concrete's breaking down inside. It also doesn't fit modern cars. You can, I have a small Honda fit there. You can see that doesn't really fit in, so most other cars don't fit in for sure. And so, uh, we're proposing a you know kind of pretty standard double uh, two-car garage. Um, originally, it's a little more ornamental, but but again, I've kind of scaled that back uh, based on the historic district characteristics. Um, all the exterior siding is stucco to match the current house. Uh, like Abby mentioned, the roof line's lower. Um, I think the whole point was that the new addition, the way what we're proposing is we think is pretty definitely subordinate to the existing historic structure from being far, far back and pretty simple. Um, staff proposed conditions, we, we fine with all of them, maybe just to talk about them real briefly. Um, I took some notes on what Abby said. Uh, yeah, I, I apologize about some of the documents being off with some of the measurements. I think that's reflective of it being the fourth iteration and that, that's our mistake. As Abby said, generally the site plan numbers are right there, but we will certainly work with her to get those cleaned up. Um, the garage pitch, you know, one of the guidelines talks about secondary feature, secondary structures being compatible but subordinate. And I think we were just wrestling with what roof pitch is compatible and what's subordinate and what's the right balance there. And, and if we want a lower pitch on that gable, we're certainly, certainly okay with that. Um, so happy to do that. Um, and we'll do the window comparison form as well. Um, as far as the fences, we, we were not thinking of altering the side fence at all, since it's our neighbor's fence too, and she just put some work into it. it and it goes up to her gate on her side. Um, so we're thinking of keeping the side fence there. The, the front fence, yeah, would push back, and the idea would be to have it look like the side fence, but shorter, just four feet high. And we can certainly clarify that in the plans. Um, I think that's it. I don't know anything I missed. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, yeah, that's it. We really, again, really appreciate it, Abby. It's been fun over the past six months kind of learning about this process and the history of the house. And I, we think we have a proposal that's emphasizes the, you know, ex, ex, I don't know how to say it, but shows the characteristics of the horse historic district, but is subordinate and uh, also gets the form and the function that we need, you know, in terms of how we live with all the little kids now. So thank you. We appreciate it. Ask for approval if possible. And if, if you don't mind, this is Dick Young here. I'm helping yeah. Tom and Margaret. Um, I'll, my address is 2060 Hoyt Street. And I've been helping Tom and Margaret with the design here. Uh, we've done multiple iterations. 
Um, Tom, I think you touched based on most everything I would say. However, the um, for clarity, so you guys can make an informed decision, we are proposing those discrepancies between a six, seven and eight foot seven addition to the north. Uh, we would like to pursue the eight foot seven. Um, our earlier iterations, the main focus was to emphasize this great double wide lot they have. Um, as they mentioned, they do a lot of gardening. So us pushing the garage to the north was in essence to capture some Southern exposure for um, vegetables in the Southwest corner of the lot. And then really the whole idea of this addition on the ground plane, as well as the second level is to create an interaction with that great side yard. The whole reason kind of Tom and Margaret bought this lot. Um, you, they mentioned their children. So they run around here in the side yard, hence the request for side patio doors as well. Um, in regards to the patio elements, possibly wrapping around, um, we're open to interpretation. I, I think um, our intent is to give them just something functional out of that side patio door. Um, and then in regards to discrepancies with um, dimensions, fence and so forth, we can definitely address all of those. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, commissioners, have you any questions for the applicants? No. Okay, I, I, I see no um, no questions for y'all. Thank you very much for for attending the meeting. Um, Jen, any um, anyone from the public that would like to speak? Any comments that you I see? I don't see any emails, and I don't see any hand raises. If any, anyone wanted to raise their hand, they can. Okay. Nothing yet. Nobody. Okay. All righty. Um, Abby, did you want to uh, make any comments after the applicants spoke? No, I don't have anything else. Okay, great. Abby, thank you very much. All right, then we will go into deliberation. Um, so we have quite a few things here, <laughs> a lot. So maybe um, to start, does anyone, um, shall we talk about the addition and the massing? Um, staff feels that it's compatible. What, uh, what all do the commissioners think? Are there any comments? May I address, address this? Um, I think there are many, um, many really great things about this project. And I really, and I think that the idea of using the side yard, you know, generally we don't like to see um, additions that you can, can be seen from the right of way, but in this case it's pushed back and it's, um, you know, it seems very appropriate. The one place where I have, um, some issues has to do with the height of the roof of the addition and also the height of the um, the eave because it sort of doesn't seem to relate either to the house or to sort of the dormer section on the other side. Mm -hmm. And so um, I'm looking at um, I'm looking at guideline 3.7, which is design the roof of an addition to be compatible with the original structure and surrounding historic context. And this one, even though I think that it's correct that the, the top of the ridge line is lower, I actually think that the fact that the eave doesn't match and it doesn't that this um, ridge doesn't match the one on the other side makes it look rather awkward. And I think it'd be more successful if it was lowered down to meet the, if the whole, that whole section was actually lowered down, I think it would be more compatible. Um, and I say this also because again, it is one, something that you will see in a distance from the right of way, which I don't think is a problem, but it still is something that you do see from the right of way. Okay, Anne, thank you. What are, the, any other commissioners have any comments to what Anne just said? Yeah. This is Brad. I, I was actually going to make the same comment. I'm, I have no um, issue with the projection into the side yard. I think that it's a, it's a nice um, addition and it'll work really well with the house. But I do think the, the, the scale of the, the way that gable sits on the roof from the mm -hmm. front really um, it uh, accentuates the kind of the verticality of it more than this type of house would. So this house, you know, when you look at this side, right side image we're looking at you really feel like you're kind of living in the roof a bit with the way the eaves come down to the the roof line and i think that's something that this addition is not compatible with so i think that there needs to be some work there to resolve those those two it doesn't necessarily need to be exactly the same but right now i think it's 
the um, compatibility is a little too jarring between the two. Thank you, Brad. Commissioners? Gary, Graham, Aaron? I think I can't do anything but echo what I feel like the rear placement works well, but with mm -hmm. the small dormer on the um, north side here and, and seeing all those layers, I, I agree with the comments that Ann and Brad have made that, that there's a, a bit of a balance there, I think, that could be more subordinate, but also still really nicely compatible. Okay. All righty. Thank you very much. Um, so let's move on. Um, what about the, um, the width of the windows in the addition to match the width of the historic windows? Did you have any comments to what staff? I think that goes a long ways in helping it be um, well integrated with the and compatible with the historic house also. I think the wider windows, the taller roof, sort of give that, that north side addition a, a, a bulkier mass that the windows would help as well. So I agree with staff there. Okay. Anyone else comment about staff's comment? All right. Yeah, this, this is. Yes, Brad. Go well, I, I was just going to say when when I was looking at the elevations, I I agree with staff comments. The elevation that we have right up on the screen now is a very wide window, and then when you go to the the um, application drawing T one, there's a rendering on the bottom, and that the window looks a little narrower and the proportions a little taller. And I think going back to that rendering and kind of comparing the two, you see how it's much more successful um, getting it a little closer to the, the proportions that you see on the existing house. And I think that this rendering is a little closer to what we're talking about. So I, I agree. I think the, the windows are um, just fighting kind of the overall verticality of, the, mm -hmm. of that, that volume. So it's not very um, compatible right now. Okay. All right, anyone else? All right, I don't see any hands up. Um, what about the uh, pitch of the roof on the garage? Does anyone have any comments regarding the garage? I, I agree with the staff comment that the uh, mass of the garage can be reduced by reducing the roof pitch and it then becomes more of a subordinate structure um, it's almost as if there's more mass above the eave line <laughs> because of the roof pitch. And I think lowering the roof pitch would be a good move. Okay. Graham, Brad, Aaron, Ann, anyone else? I see a this lot is, of Yes, Brad. This is Brad. I mean, I, I agree. And if you go back to that, that rendering on the first sheet, you can see the, that, that pitch of that, the garage there. And it is very visible in the side yard there. So I think by pulling that down, it's going to help quite a bit with making that more subordinate. Okay, yeah, I, I agree with that. Absolutely. Um, so shall we talk about the porch? Um, cladding the gable end of the porch with wood rather than stucco? This is Gary. Um, I agree with the comment that the gable end should be should not be stucco. Um, I have a little bit of trouble with the whole porch because the, the original building is not as Victorian as it might have once been because of what was done with the stucco application. Mm -hmm. And so the porch should, it can have Victorian proportions, but I don't, I don't think it should emphasize any Victorian detail. So it should be simple. I think the roof pitch is right. The projection is right. Maybe the columns should be simple columns. They shouldn't be yeah. two columns. You know, the details should just be um, simplified using Victorian proportions, but not Victorian detail. Yeah, I agree with that. Any other comments about the porch? I, I think that's a good comment. I, I agree with that um, as well. I don't think it... Um, should be simplified. The house, you know, over the course of its life has obviously been pared back and simplified. And I think that the design of the porch should reflect that. I think I, I just want to say that I appreciate the applicants 
you know, willingness mm -hmm. to go back and see the Sanborn maps and kind of look at that footprint. Mm -hmm. Sounds like there were a number of uh, more complicated uh, <laughs> configurations that were, and, and you can see with such a big yard how, mm -hmm. how that would be tempting. But um, I agree about the simplicity comments, but I, I also feel like it's a great decision and, and one I commend for working with that very typical neighborhood style and, and very, um, very fitting of the of the house and, and that historic context. So um, nothing other than confirmation there. Okay, great. Um, have I missed anything else that we would like to discuss? Anne, please. I, you know, I'm actually not so sure about the gable end of the of the porch because I think the house has been in its finish so completely altered mm -hmm. that I just worry, and I think this actually is what sort of what Gary is saying, that I worry that in going back to the to something that's the original detailing, you're gonna have one triangle that's gonna be pretty out of place with the rest of what's happened to the structure. And I totally understand why the applicant is showing it the way that they are because they're responding to the house as it is currently, not the house as it historically was finished. And so I would be, I would tend to let the applicant decide on how, what to do with that gable end because I just think it, there's the possibility of it looking for exa exactly what Gary said, looking like you're grafting onto this house that's been really um, altered in its finishes, a historically appropriate porch, which is gonna look quite strange. Any other comments about that? No? I, I hear what Ann's saying, um, and I, I would not suggest that the replacement of that gable be a Victorian replacement. It, it, might, it might be completely open. Um, you know, uh, if, a, if the porch was something that Charles Moore might have done, in this particular case, that would be maybe the best thing that could be done. Um, and I don't want to, I'm not suggesting that, but I'm just saying that because the house has been altered, the porch becomes something of a design challenge in terms of it can't be too Victorian and at the same time it needs to be respectful of what's happened to the house over time. Um, and so maybe, you know, the columns are, are, are of a different style. Um, yeah. And maybe even the pitch doesn't have to be a Victorian pitch. Just, you know, just this, what's, what's shown just seems wrong given what happened to the main building over time. Okay. Any other comments regarding that? No? All right. Uh, I don't, I don't... Go ahead, Brad. Yeah, this is Brad. I don't have any com any more comments regarding that. I think that was that was some some good comments and and mm -hmm. thoughtfulness. You know, there's a couple things I think that need to be looked at more closely as it relates to the the addition as well. And I'm you know looking at um, the drawing on a uh, detail two on a four, and it's the north elevation. And on the back you see the gable um, extending down and kind of um, embracing so it's the existing gable embracing the addition but then when you turn to the back elevation on a3 which is the west elevation that that existing gable ties into the um, gable of the addition so i think there needs to be some resolution when 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 looking at the um, the addition gable and how that all ties together i think there's a couple areas that aren't um, aligning right now. And I think it'd be good to, to make sure that those get taken into account when you're working through the design issues. Okay. okay. Yeah, that's, that's all I had on that. That's great. Thanks, Brad. Anything else? Anybody want to chime into what Brad said? No, I think it makes sense that that yeah. Interrupted cable versus continuing through. So yeah, but um, I think a good catch. Yeah. 
All righty. Anybody else have any other comments? Any, any general comments about any anything that we see here? There's a lot going on here. I, I think in general, like everybody said, you know, the, the intent and the placement and the subordinate effort that's been made, I think is all moving in the right direction. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it sounds like we all agree pretty closely with um, yeah, Abby's analysis and, and the staff recommendations as well. Right, all righty. Um, so um, moving toward uh, a motion, do we need to incorporate um, Anne's comments about the eaves in the addition? Jen? I guess, I'm sorry, I guess what I would suggest adding to the, this is a, my suggestion, mm -hmm. that we add point number seven, which is to restudy the height of the addition roof and the, the, to restudy the height of the roof and the eave on the addition. So and just, the, yes. I think the question is gonna be whether restudying would be a condition. Usually restudying is something that's too vague for staff to actually yeah. evaluate. So that's something that you guys need to, to consider is whether these conditions can be conditional approval and go back to staff for approval or whether they need to go back to you guys. Okay. I, I would also say, I'm sorry, Adam Hernandez, okay. city attorney. Um, yeah. One of the conditions, uh, number three, reduce the pitch of the roof on the garage. Um, if the commission were to, to go forward with that, um, kind of along the lines that, that Jen is talking about, this, this would be an approval with a condition. So, you know, any minimal reduction of that pitch is going to fit the condition. And so again, you may want to think, is there, is there something more concrete you can provide in terms of pitch that meets the guidelines? Or okay. is this something that you, you can't measure or, or review at this time and, and need to see it come back? And let me know if, if, if you understood what I was just saying there. I felt like I was fumbling. No, I think I think you do. I yeah, we're just not the, the condition isn't specific enough. It's probably not giving the applicant enough information about what we actually want. Well, unless your thought is any reduction in pitch is is meeting the guideline. Okay. So what is what do the commissioners think about that, Jen? And, did you have something? And, yeah, I don't think that you have to necessarily um, specify exactly what it has to be. I think you could say this or less or something like that. Like, it, it, um, you know, if you think that the, I don't know what it is, 12-12 pitch or something like that is inappropriate, but an 8-12 pitch or lower would be fine. You know, maybe it's a maybe it's a 312 would be better or something. I don't know. I, I don't think you have to say exactly what that number is. Um, but I think you can say a number or less if you feel like you can come up with that. Okay. And Adam, tell me if I'm totally wrong there. <laughs> no, you're, you're right. I think so, yeah. Keep in mind, if you go with the motion, you are approving with conditions. So the, the applicant should be able to move forward, meet those conditions and get their, um, you know, permits or approvals, what, whatever right. we want to call that. And so yeah, when they I'm are too open-ended, um, it, it does need the commission to, to talk among themselves on whether, you know, this is something that they need to see come back to them to determine whether it meets the guidelines, or if it is something that, you know, staff can just mark off on a checklist and obviously they, they have met that condition. Gary. Might, might I suggest regarding the garage roof, I, I, I kind of looked at it. Um, if we specified that it was a 612 roof pitch or less, that would be enough of a reduction and offer some uh, not only specific guidance, but some flexibility to the applicant and it would meet what we're talking about. Commissioners, 
What do you think about what Gary just offered? I feel like we're maybe flirting with territory here that is getting prescriptive. I, I mm -hmm. don't disagree, Gary, proportionally, but I'm looking guideline wise, you know, can we point to a guideline that I think compatibility in the district for garages would probably be that, but I, I think six or seven conditions, and I, I completely understand where Adam and Jen are, you know, wanting very concrete things. Mm -hmm. um, feels like there's a lot of moving parts out there. Maybe yeah. That's my opinion, but, you know, I think um, seven conditions and borderline on guideline compatibility versus, you know, giving directive, which isn't necessarily our purview. It's just something that I want to be cautious of, not that I'm yeah. calling any one thing out, but I guess that's sort of an initial reaction here. I'm curious to hear what others think. Yeah, Gary? So, Graham, are you suggesting that we deny this and have it come back and them address all of the issues with a revised uh, application? I think that leaves maybe a little more flexibility yeah. here. And we've given a lot of good, I understand and I respect the the timeline and the duration that that means, but mm -hmm. um, I guess I want to be careful that we don't overextend our boundaries in being too prescriptive, but at the same time respect the owner's, um, you know, desire to see progress too. I see that there's probably multiple ways, like Anne's comment about the roof line initially. Yeah, that could be addressed a number of ways, and 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 I trust staff's judgment there for sure. But um, since we've got a couple things like that going on, mm -hmm. anyways, that's. That's my two cents, just seeing what others think. I, I certainly don't want to be an obstructionist, but I also don't want to um, overstep our, our purview. So Graham, I was actually having the same thought that it might be, I, I mean, it's, it might just be a lot easier for the applicant. Um, what, what, a, what else, um, Anne, Aaron, did you guys have a thought on that? Yeah, I'm usually of the opinion when it gets fairly complex that yeah. denial is cleaner and allows more flexibility to meet what we're requesting without okay. being prescriptive. Okay. All right. Anne? I agree and just but just want to say to the applicant that we think they've got a great project. Mm -hmm. yes. um, and it's not it's it's not I think that Graham has found a very a sort of an elegant way of getting of getting the project approved. It's we think it's a good project. It's just that there are a lot of smaller items that have come up or bigger items, whatever, yeah. that need to be addressed. And so they shouldn't take it as anything other than just a constructive way of exactly what Graham said, just a, a more efficient way of getting to a project that can be approved. Okay. Um, my question to staff, Abby, do you think um, there's been enough testimony from the commissioners that um, that um, the applicants can can work from there? Yeah, I think it's been pretty clear. Um, the one thing that I think a little bit more might be helpful is on the roof of the addition. Are you thinking both that it should come are you thinking the eave just needs to come closer to the existing or whether or not it needs to be aligned? And what is that like the should the roof pitch just be closer to the original or does it need to come down? A little bit more guidance there, I think, would be helpful. Otherwise, I'm pretty clear on everything. Okay, great. Commissioners. I would say this is just my my friendly comment. If you look at sheet A3. And I think Brad mentioned this before. If you look at sheet A3 and you look at the proposed west elevation, I think that you can kind of see where the issues are. And so I think that this, I think that one thing that could be studied would be to bring the eave line down of the addition, the eave line down and the top, the head, top of the roof so that it matches the cross gable or whatever however you refer to that piece that's on the right-hand side. All right. Thanks, Anne. Any other comments for Abby before we move on? All right, then do I hear a motion? I guess since I'm the meanie that proposed it, I can, <laughs> I can, I can uh, create a motion here for you, Madam Chair. 
uh, again, as Anne mentioned, you know, emphasizing that I think this is, is very close, but, but this is more to allow the applicants the flexibility in resolving a list of items. So I think it can come through cleaner. But uh, that said, Madam Chair, I move to deny application number 2020-COA-423 for the addition, alterations, and garage demolition and replacement at 3025 Newton Street as per design guidelines 2.14, 2.19, 2.20, 2.23, 2.36, 2.37, 2.38, 3.2 through 3.4, 3.6 through 3.9, 4.18, 4.19, and 5.9, character defining features for the Wolf Place Historic District, presented testimony, submitted documentation, and information provided in the staff report. Thank you, Graham. Do we have a second? I'll second. Thank you, Aaron. All right, let's do a roll call vote. Be before we vote. Um, yes, Mr. Adam. So, so just keep in mind that the staff report was meant for an approval with conditions and it listed the design guidelines that supported approval. Um, my advice may be that you want to go back through the staff report and see what were those specific guidelines that you felt were not met. Cite those as being the basis for any denial rather than just a, a reiteration of, of what was listed as, as approval. Understood. No, Adam, that makes sense. Thank you. Um, and so at, at this point, you, you may want to just withdraw the motion before there is any action and you can make a new motion based on the, the guidelines that are applicable. Certainly. So Madam Chair, I will move to withdraw that motion. All right, Graham. And does that need a second, probably? I or accept. Be safe. Aaron, do you, you accept the withdrawal? I do accept it. Thank you. So then looking back through, I see guideline 4.19, which was to design a new garage or secondary structure. And we had talked about roof of the garage. So we cite guidelines 4.19, um, guideline 3.9, which is in addition to the historic structure compatible, but differentiated from, mm -hmm. that would speak to our, our roof line conversation. Um, I would also include 3.8 for subordinate to the existing structure. Um, 3.7, I think, actually specifically really hits on Anne's comment. Mm -hmm. 3.6 was um, staff reports directive on the window proportions. Let's see. Anybody else? So I got a, no, I got a question about 3.8. Um, if yeah. we're denying it, I think we were all in agreement that the location of the addition agreed, Brad. I'm sorry, was a subordinate. So I think we wouldn't we wouldn't include that one. But I agree with 4.19 and 3.7 and 3.6. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. Everybody. I, I agree. All right. That's uh, 3.2. Would eight. that also be? And 2.36, what do you folks think about those? 2.2 and 2.36. Mm -hmm. um, well, that that narrows it down quite a bit. Should we try one more? Yeah. yeah. Yes, can I hear a motion? All right, Madam Chair, I move to deny application number 2020-COA-423 for the additions, alterations, garage demolition and replacement at 3025 Newton Street as per design guidelines 2.2, 2.36, 3.6, 3.7, 3.9, 3.9, character defining features for the Wolf Place Historic District presented testimony, submitted documentation and information provided in the staff report with uh, with no condition. Thank you, Graham. Is there a second? Yeah, I'll second. Thank you, Erin. All right, um, we will do a roll call vote. Brad. Aye. Erin. Aye. Graham. Aye. Gary. Aye. Anne. Aye. And Julie votes aye as well. 
the motion is denied. Um, it's a great project and we look forward to you coming back. Um, thank you very much. So we've been out this for a while, commissioners. Do people wanna take a break, uh, like a three minute break or would you like to just power through? We've got two more items. I'm not seeing any. Just not, go for it. For it. Let's just go for it then. All right. So be before you guys get to um, the uh, business item, there, the first design review item that you guys had um, was a motion of condition approval with conditions. And it turns out that there were no conditions associated with that approval. So oh, it actually should be an approval. Yeah. So we need you to someone to make a motion to amend something previously adopted. And then um, it would be to amend the motion that was adopted on 3043 Stout Street to um, to conditionally approve the design review by striking the word conditionally. All right. <laughs> Who's up for it? <laughs> <laughs> it wants to take that on. I'm on a roll here, Madam Chair. Go for it, Graham. Go for two messy ones in a row. I would like to move to amend the previous motion for item 2020-COA-422 at 3043 Stout Street. Um, to amend that motion to remove the conditional approval and instead state full approval. Do I hear a second? I'll second. Thank you, Erin. All right, uh, let's do a roll call vote again. Brad? Aye. Aaron? Aye. Graham? Aye. Gary? Aye. Ann? Aye. And Julie votes aye as well. Uh, the motion uh, passes as amended. Um, thank you very much. Uh, sorry about sorry about that, guys. No, okay. I mean, it was just a typo that was, um, it was accidentally in the motion that staff oh. wrote and then, but there were no conditions. So um, there were no I conditions. This, yeah. That needed That's okay. Alrighty, so we are moving on to the business item, which is a proposed update to the LPC bylaws. Jen. Yep, here we go. Uh, okay, so the reason that you guys, uh, we are recommending um, that you all update your bylaws is that the bylaws were up updated, I think in May of this year to allow for, um, for a, partially in-person, partially virtual meeting. This is to um, change this to, um, because when they're extenuating circumstances um, where there are, um, where it may not be safe for the commission to all meet in person or to partially meet in person um, to have a fully virtual meeting. So that's basically what this is. And then also what happens if one of you drops off during the voting and how do we capture your vote or not? That's really it. All right. Um, commissioners, do you have any questions for staff? Yeah. Um, there is a um, there is a the uh, opportunity for public comment. Jen, is anyone um, see any hands raised? No. All right. All right. Um, all righty. Um, the commission will then go into deliberation. Are there any comments from the commission regarding what Jen has proposed? All right, do I hear a motion to uh, adapt um, the proposed bylaws? Madam Chair, I'll move to adapt the updated um, changes to the, to the bylaw language in section seven as presented. Is there a second? No second. Thank you, Gary. Uh, we will do a roll call vote, Brad. Aye. Aaron. Aye. Graham? Aye. Gary? Aye. Ann? Aye. Julie also votes aye. Um, which brings us to our next uh, discussion item. Thank you, Jen. Um, our next discussion item is the proposed uh, La, Lama, or La Alma Lincoln Park Historical Cultural District. And Kara is here to tell us about that. Can I uh, make a I have a question. All right. Um, I was present at a historic Denver virtual meeting where this uh, proposed district was discussed. 
and I'm wondering whether I should be recusing myself. Um, I don't have any conflict of interest per se, but I was probably part of at least uh, hearing about the discussion at Historic Denver at their committee meeting where this uh, uh, proposed district uh, and its application was discussed. Okay. Adam, do you have any thoughts? I, I don't think you need to, to abstain or, or recuse yourself. I think this is just a, an informational item. Um, additionally, when, when it comes to, to you all, um, it, I mean, as long as you can make an impartial decision, you should be fine as well. But we, we could discuss when, when the time comes if you want to delve into a little further. Okay, Adam, thank you. Thanks, Gary. Kara, take it away. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm going to share my screen because I was having server issues and couldn't attach my presentation to everybody else's. And I was kind of terrified that I would destroy everyone else's uh, <laughs> presentation. And I did not want all of my colleagues to hate me. So hold on one second. Jen, I can, it says, I'm not sure I can share. It should let you, I made you a co-host. Yeah, I've got a pop-up to share my screen and it says who can share all panelists. It, it, it seems like I should be able to, but it won't let me. Or don't oh, click on go. the Sorry. arrow, just click on the, the like middle of it. <laughs> yes, thank you. I, I had the same issue that. earlier. Thank it's you. so fun, this Zoom thing. <laughs> okay, so we just wanted to give you guys a little bit of background on a proposed um, cultural historic district. Um, and then what would that look like? Because there will be proposed customized design guidelines that go along with it. Um, and so Gary, uh, Shannon and I talked about presentation that she gave to the Historic Denver uh, group. So you may get a little bit of overlap of between hers and mine. Uh, so the La Alma Lincoln Park proposed cultural historic district is a community led initiative. It came out from members of the community. Um, uh, they formed a neighborhood committee or a steering committee to work on this. And then they applied for a Historic Denver Action Fund to help fund the research and writing of the historic context and part of a proposed historic designation application. So the neighborhood did extensive research and outreach to the community. This took the form of various listening sessions, flyers, community meetings, outreach to the council members, both the formal council, former council member Lopez and the current council member Jamie Torres. Um, we as staff attended a variety of these sessions. Um, sometimes I was present just for the listening sessions to hear what the community had to say to us. Um, sometimes at the community meetings, I made some presentations, but it was really a community driven outreach at that point. <clears throat> they reached out to current and past residents. They completed a historic context and have now submitted a draft designation application to our office. As you can see on the right, sorry, <coughs> I'm fighting a bit of a cold. This is the proposed boundaries of the historic district. And so um, for those of you who were at the, the des December 1st, I believe, meeting with you guys, or mid-November meeting maybe, um, for 910 Galapago, it was, you know, it's just kind of off over here. And so a lot of the history, there's a lot of overlap between the 910 Galapago designation application and this with the importance of the Chicano movement and the early development of the neighborhood. So there's going to be kind of a lot of overlap between the two and a lot of the um, historic context from the 910 Galapago was taken from the historic context document that was completed by um, Historic Denver. So the proposed historic cultural district would reflect the layers of history of this particular neighborhood from the early development um, through to the Chicano movement. It would uh, have criteria for history, architecture, and culture with an extended period of significance from um, 
1889. I'm sorry, it's on the next slide. I won't try to make it up and try to remember, but it goes to 1980. Um, and so when we were working um, with the Landmark Ordinance Task Force and starting to do a lot of research on cultural districts and cultural criteria, we looked at what a lot of other cities did. And for any district that was coming forward uh, with cultural significance, there are customized design guidelines. And that's how a lot of cities are are addressing um, cultural districts is to do customized design guidelines that really reflect the culture of the community, that honor the community that's there and, and come through with a lens of equity when looking at the design guidelines. So we as Landmark staff have been working with the community on proposed customized design guidelines because we want when this moves forward to LPC and then if it goes forward um, to city council, we want the community to understand what would be the customized design guidelines? What design guidelines would they be under? So we want it to move through at the same time as the designation application. So we wanted to give you guys um, a, a little preview of this, start talking about it with you um, and get some of your input on this. And then we are going to be taking this out to the community um, in the first quarter of next year. So one of the things that we looked at um, as a group um, with the uh, small members of the, a small group of the community on with myself, Abby and Brittany have been working on the customized design guidelines with input from, from Jen as well. And so one of the things we really talked about what, what were the character defining features of the Alma Lincoln Park neighborhood? And one of them is the importance of murals and how um, murals are really um, come out of the Chicano movement. So murals are an important part of the, the neighborhood. But we talked with the community and we asked them to like, you know, walk your neighborhood, see what's important, what are the characteristics that are important to your neighborhood. Um, so we, this is a list of what, what we are finding as the character defining features of the neighborhood from the community, as well as from staff's input of our various drive-bys, walks-throughs, reconnaissance surveys. So there's a variety of styles and types, um, Victorian cottages, Italianates, bungalows, um, front gable cottages, four squares and classic cottages. Uh, these are all, or most of them are vernacular in nature. They are not as high style as you're going to find from a Queen Anne in Potter Highlands or something in Capitol Hill. So these are a little more vernacular in nature. The neighborhood is primarily residential, um, single unit, duplex, and multifamily. There's a smattering of commercial and institutional buildings. There's a high number of sister houses or series or rows of matching buildings. The materials are predominantly brick, wood, and stucco, um, but not necessarily um, the true genuine three-part stucco. Um, there's some aluminum, steel, vinyl, and permastone found throughout. Uh, for the windows, they are primarily double hung with some sliders. They are predominantly vinyl with some wood. Um, our guesstimation is about 80% of the windows in the district have been replaced with vinyl. There are some ornate character defining or character windows as we're calling that. And the fenestration pattern overall has been retained for the windows. In terms of entrances, we see a lot of full width and partial, partial width, width, full width and partial width porches. Some of them are original porches and some of them are a combination of materials. Um, sometimes you're seeing bungalows on Queen Anne's like you'd see up on Potter Highlands. Um, and then we're often finding that the doors have been replaced and the doors are not really character defining features, although the fenestration pattern has typically been retained. In terms of architectural features, we see a lot of detailed wood on trims and <clears throat> trim on porches, on gable ends, and a lot of brick detailing and some cornice work. And in terms of site features, one of the most prominent things within the district or the proposed district are fences with multiple, multiple materials and sizes. And as you can see on most of these photos here, there's a lot of different types of fence materials, a lot of chain link. And then it is not uncommon on the front yards to see three different types, sizes, and materials of fencing. So that's something you know, we really found was really a key characteristic of the neighborhood. Um, garages are typically along the alley and um, they would be non-contributing. So any accessory structure would be non-contributing in this district. And then, as I said, murals are really important to the community. Um, they're typically on the sides of the building, but they're really intrinsically linked to the history of the neighborhood. So as we're looking at this proposed district, 
the time period um, during which the district gained its historic architectural and cultural significance goes from 1873 to 1980. So it encompasses the layers of history and culture of the La Alma Lincoln Park neighborhood. And it includes buildings across multiple eras. Both of these are really important buildings that are displayed here on the screen from two very different eras. Um, and both of these would be considered contributing to the historic district. So when we talk about the integrity of the district, um, because it's a historic cultural district, it would encompass the cultural significance of the neighborhood. So the recent changes would retain integrity. So the historic material would include stucco, stucco vinyl, and permastone, because these are all materials that would have been historic during the 1970s up until 1980. Those are historic materials. So that's really kind of one of the main changes that we would be looking at customizing within these design guidelines. So as you look at the photos here, both the stucco building on the left and the brick building on the right would both fully retain integrity and would both would be contributing buildings to the historic district. So we talked a little bit about how would we customize these design guidelines? What would this look like if this comes forward? So the existing design guidelines, you guys are really familiar with this. Down at the bottom, you see that there's sort of like appendices. And so the La Alma Lincoln Park section of these proposed design guidelines would fit in as a chapter or an appendices to the existing design guidelines. Um, only specific guidelines would be edited to reflect the character of the neighborhood. And so this small chapter would reflect the guidelines that would be changed. And so as of right now, this is currently just a Word document. So what you're seeing here is basically a Word document of the proposed changes that we're looking at. Everything that's here in this sort of lighter gray would remain the same. Only select areas that are sort of in the black would be customized. Um, and so we've kept all of the design guidelines and then struck through the things that we don't think would reflect the community and um, included in green anything new that we are recommending to be added. This is something that we've worked with the community on. We as staff have taken a couple of drafts at it. We're gonna bring it to the staff next week to have them really look at it. Um, we wanted your input and then we're going out into the community. And so these are drafts and they're just, that's what I'm really trying to emphasize is that they are, these are draft guidelines. Um, nothing is written in stone, but these are what we are proposing through a communication with the community. Um, and I was going to go over a little bit of what we're looking at, but I'm happy to take any questions or um, get any feedback on that. Or if you'd like, I could go forward and kind of show you some examples of what we're looking at. And whatever would be more helpful for you guys. Anybody have any questions for Kara at this point? No? Okay. Pardon. Okay, so um, this is just to show you kind of when you're looking at the slides, um, and I had this in as when I just emailed the slides out to people if they weren't able to attend the meeting. So the black text is part of the existing design guidelines, green is the new language, strike, strike throughs are you know, what we're recommending improving, and any orange text is a brief explanation. So throughout the design guidelines, Anytime that you see the word original, you should read it to mean original or historic. This is not going to be changed in all the design guidelines. So as you're looking through, and I'm gonna come out of the picture here. So anywhere in the design guidelines, we're not gonna reprint all of them, but at any chapter, if it says original, it would mean read it to say original or historic. So that it includes those um, changes. In this, in this district. In this district, yes, sorry, in this <laughs> district, yes. Um, <clears throat> that um, because changes to the original historic fabric have achieved their own significance. Um, so anything there would mean original or historic. And so this is going to allow for additional flexibility in materials throughout. And just as a reminder, the historic materials would include stucco, vinyl, aluminum, and chromosome. <laughs> um, and so just as an example of like one of the changes that we're recommending making in two point five, it says that, you know, <clears throat> test the removal in, of um, material, sorry, you guys are, your faces are all over the words, test the removal of the covering of materials such as stucco and permastone. We would cr cross that off because those would be historic materials. So we don't want people to think that necessarily that they have to get rid of those, that those could be retained. 
Um, so this is just sort of an example of some of the changes that we're making. And one of the things that we really talked about um, amongst ourselves, amongst staff, and with the community is looking at the layers of history from the early settlement. This was an original, you know, this was an early working class immigrant community neighborhood. Um, it was normally or, or historically primarily European immigrants. Over time, it became a primarily Latino immigrant community. And you see the layers of history of all of the residents um, in these buildings. And we've been using these three buildings as an example of sort of your sister houses. Um, and you can look and see from right to left, the most, um, the, the one that has the least amount of changes to the one that has the most amount of changes. But all of those changes are historic. And how do we really look at a historic district and talk about what are changes over time when those changes are historic and what is important to be retained. So through conversations with the neighborhood, um, they really felt it was important to, you know, this, this building here on the right, that, you know, the one that's the most intact, that, that's important to keep that, but it is also important to keep the building here on the left that has the post-war porch and the perma stone and, um, you know, and you know, you've got changes here where part of the gable ends were covered and the porch was changed. And then the one in the middle, um, you know, has a brand new um, aluminum or, or a vinyl window likely. And then you have changes here to the gable end with a new window there. And then all three of these buildings reflect the history and changes of the, of the, of the district. And so we are recommending tweaking some of the design guidelines. Instead of saying avoid covering historic materials, we wanted to call out what were sort of the two primary historic materials that we were finding, which is brick and or decorative wood features. So some of these, you know, avoid covering these decorative wood features that are there. Um, but also that would mean, you know, respecting this fully, you know, 19, you know, post-war 1960s porch that was put in with, you know, now what would be considered, you can't quite see behind the tree, the, um, you know, wrought iron or the, um, that the new porch supports. Um, and so this is an attempt to preserve the layers of history um, as changes would be made to the historic district. Gary, did you have a question? I have a possible suggestion. Rather than saying brick, would it might 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 it be more inclusive to say masonry? Because we don't want them covering stone, lintels, and sills, just mm -hmm. we didn't mention. That I mean, I'm not sure if, whether that's too specific or not, but it's a uh, um, just looking at these three buildings. All three of those have masonry, lintels, and sills over the uh, window openings. Thank you. That's a good. That's a good thing to note. I, I'm taking notes as we go along as to to input on that. All right. I'll go on a little bit. If you guys have any other questions, let me know. And I don't want. I realize. The end of the meeting, so I don't want to take too long, but I did. We want to sort of introduce you guys to some of these ideas. Um, one of the other things we noted is that a lot of the historic doors have been replaced, and the community didn't really feel like the doors themselves were important or character defining. Is and we as staff didn't find many doors that were character defining, but that the fenestration pattern was really important. Mm -hmm. And so, on the rare occasion that there might be a door that would be appropriate, instead of saying preserve all historic doors, um, preserve original or historic doors when they are character defining features of, of the building. So it provides that flexibility that on occasion, there may be that door that really is important to the, to, to the character of the district, but it provides the residents the flexibility of changes to that. Um, and the, the, the community members didn't particularly care much about the material of the door, just that you weren't adding new um, changes to the front of the facade or adding new doors to that. So this is one of them that would address not necessarily keeping the material of the doors, but the way that it looked through the um, presentation from the front facade. Another important part that they discussed along with the doors is the windows. Most of the windows have been replaced. Um, there are a few character windows as somewhat as seen like here on this building on the left, but there are some character windows and it is important to retain the character windows that are on a readily visible facade. But anything that's on sort of the rear sides or the sides, 
community didn't feel was important to retain those. Um, but so they did would want to call out and say some of these character windows are important to retain. But in terms of any other windows, you could replace them and put in any material that you would want. Um, so long as the fenestrate that the opening was the same and the window fit the opening. So you couldn't keep a really wide window and then just put a little tiny window in with filler. It should fill the window, but they weren't really particular on the material that was used for the windows. And we feel like because so many of them, vinyl is what's already there, it's part of the historic character. And it's been kind of a, uh, <clears throat> a lot of us discussing that vinyl is historic and is important to the character of this district, which is so different than the way we think about other historic districts. So this is why we wanted to bring it to you guys to sort of talk a little bit about and start thinking about, you know, what are historic materials when your period of significance goes to 1980. Uh, similarly, there's been a lot of changes to the porches, porch materials. Um, so composite materials might be appropriate um, rather than retaining, you know, where we say that, you know, concrete or synthetic materials, you know, can't put those on, you know, that might be appropriate for this historic district. And then I wanted to just go a little bit into chapter five as well with you guys. Um, we had a lot of discussion about chapter five because there's a lot of things in here that we already don't have purview over. Um, and so we went with the route of removing anything that we don't actually have purview over. So chapter five actually will have a little bit more of a heavy hand because we're just removing a lot of stuff that you guys don't review anyways. But for clarity for the community, we don't want them to read this and think that vegetation is something that they need to be concerned about. It's not something that we review. Um, and then in consultation with parks, because La Alma Lincoln Park would be uh, part of the proposed district, they would feel a lot more comfortable if um, it's clearly stated that vegetation, plantings, and trees are not part of the LPC's purview. And so that's something that they are, <clears throat> they would really like to see that that's um, removed from the design guidelines because it does not require a permit. So it's not something that you guys would review. We also changed a few things like sidewalks. That's not something that um, the uh, LPC reviews. We changed sidewalks to walkways. So it reflects walk walkways going up to a property, but that it isn't sidewalks. So just that we are trying to you know, clarify the design guidelines to remove things that aren't um, within their purview. And then because fences are so important, we are recommending removing the entire design guidelines on fences and rewriting it for something new because we want it to really reflect the character of the historic district. Um, and so we are recommending that the design guidelines um, uh, reflect the, the fences that are there. So we're saying that they should be similar to those used historically within the district in terms of their scale, transparency, character, and variety of styles and materials. Um, that we wanted to call out materials that are already present and would still be appropriate. So such as wire, cast metal, wood picket, or chain link. Um, and that brick, stone, and stucco columns could be combined with open metal fencing, which is what we find in the historic district, or the proposed historic district. Um, the one thing we didn't find um, is vinyl fencing materials. So we did want to be specific to call out that while vinyl would be appropriate for windows, um, it wouldn't really be appropriate for fence materials. It's not something that is seen in the historic district. Um, and then we did want to specifically call out that the front yard fences shouldn't be more than 48 inches because that's a zoning rule. And we didn't want to have some, um, our design guidelines to be in conflict with zoning. So we just wanted to call that out right away. So there just wouldn't be any confusion from that. Tara, what about concrete block columns? Mm -hmm. Um, that would probably be appropriate. Um, and it's something that we could add. Let me write that. You want to add that one then? Yeah. Thank you. Um, and what about elements such as that arbor at the gateway? Uh, those, we, that would be a, a part of the character of the district. We talk about um, other site features that would be appropriate. Um, to retain, there's a lot of different site features and that, that we want to offer some flexibility on that. I was going to see, I had some slides at other ones, it's not in this presentation, that talk about really flexibility with site features, that they're present and that we want to provide the flexibility that those could be either retained, removed, or new ones could be allowed to be added. Um, this is a way, you know, 
through sort of a lot of the um, features that are in the yards is a lot of sort of the expression of the community um, and kind of expressing their personality. And so we wanted to allow that flexibility throughout. And that was staff's thought is that that should be in there as well. Um, basically rear yard fences, um, they're incredibly varied. Um, so that would still, you know, the variety that's there would be allowed and all of these um, uh, accessory buildings would be non-contributing. Uh, one of the things that we didn't find is we didn't find, there's not really a lot of, there's not a Denver Hill and there's a wide variety. Um, and Aaron, this, we do have concrete block down here. That's what I was checking on. Um, that uh, there's a wide variety of low retaining walls. And so we wanted to specifically call out things that are found there, stone, poured concrete, concrete block, brick, and railroad ties. Um, those are materials that we find throughout the historic district. And so we wanted to specifically call out that that would be a material that would be um, appropriate for it. And since it's so different from what we have in the rest of our design guidelines, we wanted to be really explicit and call that out. So that's just a really quick overview of what staff is thinking at this time with some um, input from the community, um, but wanted to just provide this because we're gonna start going out to community and talking in broader, <coughs> Um, larger community meetings with them. And so we wanted to make sure that you guys were aware that this is where staff is thinking and then wanted to get your guys' thoughts on it. I realize it's a lot of information in a short amount of time. And let me stop sharing my screen. And That's awesome, Kara. This is, what a, what a project this is. Permit. <laughs> so this is a lot. So, so we understand one, it's, you know, you've had a long day, so you may not have a, a ton of time to like digest and talk about this but we did want to start giving you guys an overview. I'm happy, happy to take any um, questions. Um, both Brittany and Abby, it looks like, are still online. And so I'm happy for them to um, chime in if they think there's anything that we should be talking about. They've been really um, involved in this process and have um, been with all the community meetings and so that they can speak to that as well. So I I'm do have a good question. Mm -hmm. um, you indicated that the community said that murals and art are very important as part of that culture. How is that going to be addressed both for existing murals and new murals? That is an excellent question that I do not have an excellent answer for yet. <laughs> okay. Uh, we are working on it. We've had a lot of discussions. Um, we've had discussions with the attorneys. We've had discussions with community members. Um, uh, Lucha Martinez, who um, her father, Emmanuel Martinez, uh, designed a lot of in a lot of the murals in the neighborhood. Some of them have been, the, the one that's on the rec center is still there. One of them has already been removed. Um, and so Lucha is um, involved with uh, the Colorado Murals Project, which is also a historic Den Denver funded action fund grant, um, working on how to preserve the murals. We're talking with, um, we've been in conversation with LA, we're looking at things that um, Chicago and Philadelphia have done. No one has necessarily found a great solution for it because of First Amendment rights. Right. And we within the city uh, do not, painting something does not require a permit. So anyone could paint over a mural. So it's a really good question without a really good answer yet. It's something we've been working on for a while and we're getting a little bit of movement on it um, and we're having continual conversations, but we don't have a perfect answer for that right now. If you have any information, we would love to hear it. I don't, but I find that right now the most interesting aspect of the proposed district is some of that. Um, Brittany or Abby, do you have anything you want to chime in on or does anyone have any questions? Gary had a question. Well, I was going to ask about the murals as well. Um, <laughs> This is Brad. I, I actually have a question thinking back at those, um, those three sister houses that you showed us and kind of, and maybe I'm getting into the weeds here a little bit, but I was just thinking when you were showing that, you know, the period of significance goes to 1980 and those three houses were a great example where you've got kind of the original all the way over to the post-war. Post so 
the importance of the district, though, like you say, goes all the way through 1980. So those elements are important and key to to the definition of that um, that district. What what would you do if somebody comes in and they want to get rid of their post war deck and they want to replicate the traditional? Because you start really moving away from kind of the mm-hmm. essence of what makes that you know, a special historic district. So how do you, how do you, what would staff's recommendation be on something like that? Cause it's going to happen. Somebody's going to look and say, I like the one next door. I want to do that. Mm-hmm. Brittany, do you want to answer that? <laughs> I'm happy to too, but I just saw you laughing. It's com- mm-hmm. these, are com- these are the conversations we've been having as well. Um, so to me, these three houses like truly represent the evolution of the district and I don't think we have a concrete answer yet as we have also been internally discussing that. Um, So one has like a very intact 1950s porch. The middle one just has the 1950s columns. And it's like, we're trying to find a fine line of how we define like (laughs) what is significant and what is a minimal alteration that you could potentially change. And then also like, we really want it to strongly be based on historic evidence. So I don't think we've quite worked that out yet, but it's something we are also thinking about. Some of our thoughts on that is that the fully intact porch that was on the left on the light blue house, that is, you know, a full representation of a post-war porch would be retained. The one in the middle, you'd have more flexibility on because it just has components of the porch. And then the one on the far right that is the original would be retained because it is a representation of the original. The nuance of that and then how that is put into design guidelines and then interpreted by the public is something that we have not, we're still, as Brittany said, still working through. Um, But that in our head is sort of the new, how we would look at it. But we haven't figured it fully out. And one of the things that we really want to be careful with with this historic district is that we're really clear um, Mm -hmm. with you guys as as commissioners, us as staff, um, applicants and property owners, and making sure that it's really clear to everyone. Um, And also, you know, we're trying to view everything we do in this district through the lens of equity. And something, you know, a lot of the changes to this district, you know, someone, they didn't hire an architect to do it. They went out and did it themselves. Mm-hmm. And they may not have had a contractor. They mm-hmm. didn't, oftentimes don't know that you need a permit to get a fence. So now not only are you introducing that, yes, you're supposed to be getting a permit, but now you also have to talk to us as well. Mm-hmm. And so it's a lot of messaging to the community as well as trying to make, um, make sure we're making equitable decisions. And we haven't figured out a perfect way to, to do that. And it's inter- we're having internal discussions on it. Yeah, and one of the big things that I, I've been thinking a lot about with this, and uh, we've been trying to figure out how to best phrase things so that the intent behind these conversations among staff and with you all and with the community are captured in these design guidelines because we don't want in 10 years when there's a totally new com- set of commissioners Um, who doesn't, who they don't know the intent behind it. We don't want the new set of commissioners to review things in a totally different way than was intended with the guidelines. Um, And same thing with staff. And um, we want it to be really clear to the neighborhood as well. It it all has to be pretty black and white. Looks like infill is going to be tricky. Yeah. Well, what we aren't really thinking of addressing that because it has a really like standard, you know, like setback is the same. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of, you know, so, so there's not a lot of changes in that way. Um, other than the materials, that there might be some flexibility on the materials, we aren't really thinking of addressing um, too many changes there. That it actually, you know, it has a pretty regular rhythm. And that way it's similar to a lot of the other historic districts, just maybe the buildings themselves are maybe a little bit smaller, um, but we aren't recommending a lot of changes to the other chapters. So the infill might be interesting with 
materials, but we're hoping it's not too complicated for you. The one change that we are recommending outside of chapters two and five, which are the two chapters we talked about, is removing um, the, there's one design guideline that, re that refers to no faux grain wood. Um, there's a lot of faux grain wood throughout that would be removed for this particular district um, because that's part of the character of what's already there. Um, so we're hoping, yeah, we could be wrong, but we're hoping the infill isn't too complicated, too, too extra complicated for you guys. Any other questions for Kara? I see one of the attendees has their hand raised though. Yeah, we don't have oh. discussion items aren't supposed to have public comment, yes. um, but it's also uh, Shannon from Historic Denver. <laughs> and and they've been intimately involved with this. So. She yeah, has, I, I don't see anybody. I don't have her on my view. Anne. Question, and maybe it's a slightly political question. But since we just went through this whole discussion about the faux wood and we never ever approve vinyl windows, <laughs> is, there a, is there a concern, um, and I don't quite know how to put this, is there a concern that in making this particular historic district um, that, we're, that the guidelines are being downgraded and therefore the neighborhood is being looked at um, as a slightly how can I say it's like a slightly less valuable neighborhood and I mean I'm asking this not in a not exactly in a political way but do you worry do you, are you concerned that things that you say oh well in country club we would never do that but here we do and is there an issue with that I'm, I'm sure you've discussed this uh yeah that, that has been part of our thought process in um being careful in the language that we use um and how we describe it um that Part of the historic character of this includes additional materials um, and so that would be appropriate for the character of this district and it wouldn't necessarily be part of the historic character of another district within Denver um, but yes that is an important part of our um, thought process and wanting to be careful in how we talk about it and think about it um, because you know we want to highlight the importance of and one of the things we've talked about is the importance of the vernacular architecture and that that's really important. <coughs> Apologize, I'm uh, getting over a cold. I was um, thinking, oh, go ahead. Yeah, go, well, actually, if you go talk and I yeah, can I was, and mute myself. I was kind of following up on what Anne was thinking and something that's been on the back of my mind is that in some ways, this might help stop gentrification of the neighborhood because it doesn't make it so only wealthy people who can afford high-end materials that would match, you know, the earliest periods that, because that's always a concern I have is how all these historic districts then tend to become gentrified and the historic population is pushed out, say like five points, you know, how that is really turned over mm -hmm. that, you know, the flexibility might stop some of that. I don't know. Uh, it's an interesting, interesting thought though, Erin. It is one of the things we talked about in terms of that, that, um, <clears throat> well, I don't think historic districts cause gentrification. I think that they sometimes can occur along the same time period when a neighborhood has new residents moving in that at times then those new residents may say, oh, this is a great historic neighborhood, we should designate it. <clears throat> and so I don't necessarily see that there's a causal effect between designation causing gentrification. I think it's an oversimplification of a really complex issue. Mm -hmm. um, but we don't, we certainly don't want that there to be any link here. And so that is one of the things that we had considered is that you know high quality materials can sometimes be more expensive. Um, and so what are, you know, what are less expensive materials that would be appropriate for the district? Um, and because it really does reflect the character of the district, mm -hmm. they would be the appropriate materials to be there. So I think at the chair's discretion, um, if you, because, because we don't have discussion, uh, public comment for discussion items. I think um, the chair can can make a decision if 
you want to stick with that, if you want to invite Shannon to speak really quickly or. Um, sure, want. sure, that's fine. I just, I don't see that. So on my screen, I don't see anybody okay. with the hand up, but if you can let somebody in, that's fine with me. Yep, Shannon, you've been unmuted. You just have to unmute yourself. <laughs> Great, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so, well, thank you for letting me speak. Just, I will make it brief. Um, and I think Kara did a great job at explaining a lot. Uh, but one thing I did want to highlight, and that's something kind of more on, not necessarily the city's end, but historic Denver's uh, continued involvement since 2016. Um, this has been definitely a long project that we've been involved with, is that the community really did want, the intent was to see to more flexibility and equity with the whole project and that included the design guidelines. And that's really where kind of the city came in was really helping with figuring out a way to create flexibility and equity within the design guidelines by creating that customized design guideline. And that does go to the fact of the materials. And I think Aaron, that's a great point that you mentioned that is one of um, the neighborhood and historic Denver's goal, if um, we had that flexibility with materials being able to be used, that does create equity and hopefully will um, bring down potential gentrification and allow those individuals that have lived there since the 50s and 60s and 70s to be able to continue to live there. Um, so I just wanted to kind of point that out from the historic Denver and neighborhood perspective that those were really some of our main goals in this project and in the eventual uh, application and and design guidelines. So I appreciate you letting me speak and happy to answer any questions too from our perspective. Sure, thanks Shannon. Mm -hmm. Any questions for Shannon? No, but I appreciate um, that thought and that clarification. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions or go ahead, Kara. Oh, I was just gonna add just to kind of give you like process wise where we're at. Um, so we've been working with Historic Denver um, working on these customized design guidelines. Um, we are providing comments this week um, to Historic Denver on their draft designation application. And then <clears throat> we've also been working with Councilwoman Torres's office um, and community outreach within the neighborhood. And she has some really good ideas about how to do that. And we are looking to do that sort of in January, February of next year. Some of it's gonna be COVID dependent on, you know, mm -hmm. If the numbers are really high, it's going to change some of our outreach perspectives. But mm -hmm. there's going to be a lot of community engagement um, through both virtual, um, like Zoom, as well as um, phone calls for people who wouldn't necessarily may not have access to the you know high speed internet for a for a Zoom meeting. And so that will be happening, and you'll be kind of hearing more about that um, in the new year. Okay, great. Alrighty. Is there anything else for Karen? All right. Well, Kara, thank you very much. Um, and commissioners, thanks very much for, <laughs> for being kind to me through our, the first meeting. Um, if there aren't any other discussion items, then I will close the meeting. It is 426 p.m. And I guess I'll see everybody next year. Have a great holiday season. Same to you. Yeah. Yeah.